All right, here we are. All right, hey everybody. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, coming tonight. Thank you for attending. Um, I've got a, a whole bunch of professional looking slides here to show you. Um, let me show you here. It took, uh, it took me a long time to do them, at least five minutes. But first I'd like to, uh, I thought I'd introduce myself. Um, I was invited to lecture here for the Pittsburgh Chess Club. Um, and I am an old timer, I'm 51 years old now. And uh, I got my start back in the 1980s. And uh, uh, basically I've uh, been able to see chess change quite a bit over my lifetime. Uh, I grew up in Connecticut. I moved to Pittsburgh for grad school in 1990. And in 1995, I got my national master title. Uh, and my peak rating for USCF actually was 2269. Uh, I got that at age 48. Uh, which is quite quite late to have a peak rating, so I guess I'm pretty proud of that. Um, anyway, what I wanted to do is start off by just giving a brief history of how I got into chess because it's a bit unusual compared to most people. And uh, I actually have a position for my very first tournament game to show you. Uh, but the bulk of this uh, lecture is going to be on my uh, struggle and my work to improve as a chess player after getting back into uh, tournament chess at the ripe old age of 47. So these are the topics. So I was going to start with my unusual start in chess. Then I, uh, I never actually left chess, but after grad school, I, um, I only played in the Pittsburgh Chess League for years and years. That was the only chess I played, uh, probably about 20 years, 23, 24 years. Um, the Pittsburgh Chess League is a fantastic league, but playing five or six games a year isn't really going to uh, <laughs> help you improve much. But it's very interesting, when I got back into chess, I found that the world had changed completely as far as tournament chess goes. And uh, uh, what I'm hoping to do is maybe inspire you guys, um, even especially if you're as old like me, on how you can still improve your game, uh, even if you grew up in the era I did where you, the uh, resources were not nearly as good. So why don't we get started? So why I got into chess. Okay, so uh, you see this gentleman on the right here? His name is Toby Crew. You see him on the set of Jeopardy. He was uh, one of my two best friends in high school. And uh, sophomore year came around. He, uh, he was actually two years younger than everybody because he skipped two grades. Uh, he came up to me in the hall and said, hey, Jeff, they're starting a chess club. Said, Let's join. And I said, my god, no, I don't want to join chess club. I had no interest in chess when I was 15. I said, I really want to get a date sometime in my high school career, so I, I don't think I want to join a chess club. And so he walked away. But unbeknownst to me, he signed me up anyway. And uh, then he dragged me to the first meeting. And I got to tell you, I fell in love with it right away. We had a really dynamic uh, guy who started the club. He was our IT guy and librarian. And uh, uh, my best friend here, Toby, he also uh, helped out a lot. And uh, when I found out there was such lore and chess and literature and magazines and tournaments, I was hooked. Um, so we started a high school team that year. And the first year we just obliterated everybody. I don't know why we just lucky enough to have four players that were, you know, significantly better than the rest of the league. Um, but the uh, thing is what we really, really cut our teeth was the Waterbury Chess Club, uh, Waterbury, Connecticut back in the eighties. Um, my parents would, uh, our parents would drop us off every Saturday and we would play in unrated action tournaments, the action chess so for those who uh, are much younger than me is, uh, uh, 30 minutes on a side. Uh, that was back with the old wooden clocks where you had uh, no increment or anything like that. And uh, like I said, it was unrated completely. So we just played in one of those every week for about a year. This club had a whole bunch of interesting characters, uh, some of whom were later arrested. Uh, but it's funny, back then, you know, your parents didn't mind sending you off to a strange place with a bunch of strange people for a whole afternoon. Um, and then after about a year, the club introduced uh, Three rated games. You could go challenge somebody and say, I challenge you to rate a game. And they would actually, uh, Rob Roy, the guy who ran the place, he's over here on the left. Uh, he was a tournament director and he could, he could submit it for rating. So uh, we played, I played six of these matches and got my first rating. And my first rating was 1994. Um, I think most people nowadays start when they start off, of course, they're starting off at age five. They're more like at a, a hundred or so. Um, so after the first uh, six games, I decided to enter my first tournament. I entered the uh, New England Open, which uh, 
pretty big tournament for the U.S. back in uh, 1985. And, uh, you know, I had only played shorter time controls back then. But I told myself it was my first real tournament game. I was going to take it really seriously. I had a problem with attention span. I would get up a lot during the games. I promised myself I'd sit at the game since it was my first tournament game for the entire game, no matter what. And that game happened the last seven hours and 95 moves. Uh, back then, the time controls are much slower. Uh, I played against a guy who was an old, older uh, guy, I think from Russia, Viktor Polyak. And uh, he was a crafty veteran. And I want to show you the position from that first game. Let's see. Okay, so here we are. Um, this was late in the game. The game started off as a Grunfeld. I was white. And uh, I had made a mistake early in the game, and it was uh, basically on my heels for the entire time. But here's this position, and uh, it's very tense. You can see that there are past pawns here for both sides, black and for white. And technically, white's a pawn up, but his pawns are pretty shattered. And I remember, since this was so late in the game, as a first round, uh, they were the last game to finish. And there was quite a, you know, about 13, 14 people crowd around the board because there was nothing else to do but wait for us to finish so they could pair the next round. So it was his move. And he played this move, King G5. And I remember instantly alarm bells went off in my head and thinking King G5 is a very suspicious move. And I quickly saw a really interesting continuation. I'm not saying it was winning or anything like that, but it was quite interesting. And after defending the whole game, it might give me a little bit of initiative. Now I want you to take a look and see if you guys can figure out what my idea was. And you can raise your hand if you want to talk. Anybody? Any suggestions whatsoever? Ah, one raised hand. Here we go. All right. Thanks, Gabe. What's what's up? What do you think? Uh, H4. Hey, H4 is interesting. Um, I would assume that the king would probably retract and go back to H6. And you have to find the next idea, right? Do you have mm -hmm. a particular idea in mind after H4? No, not really. Not really. Okay, so let's try uh, Let's see if we can get um, another suggestion. I'm sure H4 is not a bad move. It just wasn't the idea I had in mind. Dan? How yeah, about so, rook A5? Uh, yeah, rook A5 is interesting. Right. That's not a bad idea at all. Um, and I, I assume there it also that uh, Black might retract his king move and go back to h6, which is probably, a little, probably safer. But uh, it's not bad. I think a little bit more radical, though. Gabe, uh, is your hand still raised, or did you want to lower it? Yeah, lower. Oh, sorry. OK. All right, Zach. Uh, Zach raised his hand. Hold on a second. Where is he? Oh, he lowered it. All right. There you go. Okay, so so far I have H4 check and Rook A5. So the, the I had was, was, oh, here we go. Patrick? I don't know how to do it, but what I want to eventually do is play D, is play D8, promote the queen. That's right, yeah. That's right, that's a good, that's a good goal. Actually, I'm going to uh, allow everybody to talk and see if it goes okay. I'm not big on keeping the these things. Let's see if we can work together as a group here. If you guys get unruly, I'm gonna mute you. <laughs> all right, so, all right, yeah, so right, right, right. We'd like to uh, clean his pawn, and I mean, I'd love to be able to play my king over to E2, right? Because if you think about it, that would harass the rook. And if the rook leaves a D file, I can queen the pawn, right? Um, now, let's just say, fantasize for a second, I could move the king to E2. 
Where could the road go to keep on the pond? And the only safe square that makes any sense would be D6, right? And does anybody see what would happen if you played rook to D6? Project E5, pawn takes E5, knight E4 check. Exactly, yeah. So if you can play the king to E2, you got rook to D6, E5, and the king's position on G5 is really unfortunate because then there's a fork with knight E4 check. And once you take the rook, the pawn can queen. Um, the bishop would be under attack as well in that case, in that scenario. But anyway, so the thing is, what is stopping me from moving the king to E2 is the this bishop, bishop right? <laughs> So how can we actually get rid of the bishop there and make it so it doesn't cover e2? The answer is rook takes a2, right? So the sequence I had envisioned was rook takes a2, bishop takes a2, and king e2. Okay, yes, I understand that black could bail out and play rook takes d7, knight takes d7, and and why well, black should probably draw that game. But considering as my first tournament game against the 2160. And I was struggling all game. A draw one with a little pressing would not have been so bad. Um, but of course, if I play rook takes a2, bishop takes a2, king e2, and he plays rook d6, I have some chances after e5. But I saw that, but especially back then, I wasn't very confident in my own abilities. So I was thinking to myself, I've got this crowd of people around me, and this shows a lot of my psychological issues with chess. Uh, what if I play rook takes a2, and it turns out to be a blunder, and I just lose a rook? I look like an idiot, right? So in the next few minutes, I convince myself that what I should do is play the pawn move first, because that way, if the combination doesn't work, I've only lost the pawn, right? So I go out and push my pawn to e5. And as soon as I do that, I realize that that gives up the d5 square and the whole combination doesn't work anymore. So he thought for a couple of seconds, looked at me quizzically and took the pawn. And everybody around me looked at me like I was an idiot. So that's a... a <laughs> Rule of the uh, live by is stick with your convictions uh, because if you don't, you look like an idiot anyway. Um, so let's go over the combination just to show it. What I should have played was rook takes a2 and stuck with my original idea. There's nothing better than bishop takes and then uh, king e2. And black's best actually is just to give back the rook with rook takes d7, after which you know, white can press for a little while. Because if rook d6, well, I guess this is best. Rook d6, e5, and now take the pawn. Because if you, if you get greedy, then this fork comes into play. And white is certainly no worse. Um, if black tries to move his rook out of the way, say he moves his rook even here, then after... Oh, well, I'm sorry. There, of course. And you just queen the pawn, right? But where's a uh, yeah okay if he moves to d5 for instance that's better yeah then we have e6 and suddenly white's connected pawns are going to queen right so that was an unfortunate miss after this this mishap i managed to whittle it down somehow to a knight versus rook ending and on move 95 i lost my knight and lost the game that was kind of a sad beginning to tournament chess for me but i thought it was very interesting my very first tournament game all right so, next, uh, like I said, in about in, around 2017, I decided after uh, taking about 23 years of playing a league a little bit, I decided to return to tournament chess. And here's what I found. Um, everybody is just much better than back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, the training methods have improved so much. All the online stuff you can get, everybody has a coach. Engines are so powerful. It's incredible. Um, in fact, every time I played a young person, one thing that's kind of sad is that after the game, you say, would you like to go look at the game? And they say, no, I'll look at it with the engineer or my coach. They don't even want to talk to you anymore. Uh, far fewer blunder. I'll, I'll tell you, when I was playing back in the 80s, uh, you know, a 2,000 player would blunder at least two or three times a game. It just doesn't happen anymore. Um, and the popularity of chess has increased. Uh, one thing I can tell you back in the 80s as well is that you went to a chess tournament and it looked like people might have escaped from a local asylum. Um, the people are much more well adjusted now. I know it looks insane to say that, but if you look at a chess tournament, people are fairly normal, which is 
much more interesting. Um, there are clearly more, more uh, kids, and the kids are uh, have uh, very low ratings compared to their actual strength. And the one really interesting thing I've found is that there's many fewer garbage openings. When I back in the uh, when I started, you could count on having all kinds of wacky things between kings gambits and Gorons and Alvins and you know everything that, under the sun that's uh, suspicious. But nowadays with engines and preparation, people just don't play as these garbage openings nearly as often. Um, so what do I have to do? What do, what did I have to do to try to improve? Well. I'll show you why, but eventually I chose to hire a coach for the first time in my life, age 47. I hired uh, Eugene Perlstein, very nice guy, and his uh, his uh, kind of his style and strengths match mine very well, so he turned out to be a pretty good fit. And I had to determine my, my weaknesses to be able to improve them, something I never did before. And I had to admit that my weaknesses were my chess skills in general. Um, honestly, I had none. Um, I worked on chess. I tried to memorize chess <laughs> uh, rather than uh, learn it. So my skills, my calculation, my, my tactics, uh, my maneuvering skills, all this stuff was just terrible. So here's what the agenda is for tonight. I want to take one of the areas that I needed to really improve, working with the initiative. And I want to show several examples of failures and lessons learned along the way. And these will just be game excerpts, okay? We're not going to go over every, every move, every game. But then afterwards, the second phase, I want to show you how I've gradually moved towards success. And we're going to go over more of the full games there. So are there any questions before we get started? All right, here we go. So the first game. is the game that inspired me to get a chess coach. <laughs> this game was in the Pittsburgh Open in 2017, I believe, um, against Bailin Lee. Uh, I believe a lot of you guys probably know uh, Bailin, Bailin, never sure how to pronounce the name. And uh, this game shows that I really had absolutely no clue when it came to the initiative. So let's start up. Uh, he was white, he played, he played E4, and he always plays a close Sicilian. I didn't know that at the time. I had this nice little system against close Sicilian that had brought me a lot of success. It was 2A6. It's not a bad system at all. However, the one thing it does is it falls behind in development just a little bit. So we develop our pieces fairly um, naturally here. And he plays the very aggressive F4. Um, so I play the prescribed D5. And you might notice that there's a bunch of, uh, of uh, attackers on d5, but the idea, the trick for this whole opening is that you can dissolve white's center if he plays e takes d5 by playing knight f6, using the pin on the diagonal. Um, and this turns out to work out very well for black because this f4 push is just very weakening. But Balin really surprised me with this move f5, and he played it instantly. And I realized that you know, he's, he's about to open up the position, and I wasn't really particularly ready for it. If you notice, Black spent a lot of time on these pawn moves over here, and uh, doesn't really have that much development. I really didn't want a position to open. And I knew he might attack my king, but I really had trouble calculating anything of any substance here, and also my evaluations were just awful. So, for instance, uh, actually, I have a, a question for you guys. Just out of curiosity, what would you play for Black here after F5? Yeah, you don't have to raise your hand anymore. You can just talk. Okay, D5. I'm or sorry. D4, I'm sorry. D4, yeah, okay, D4. Yes. Um, yeah, D4 is, is a move. Okay, so if you play D4, all right, and say he plays F takes E6, what would you play then? Hmm. F6. Yeah, so F6 is possible. Now, 
the issue is that um, white has not sacrificed any material yet. And you also have very weak light squares, especially around the king yes. and development. So it's just, uh, this is a uh, position probably almost lost for black already. It uh, shows you how tough this position is. It's not easy to find a, uh, a great continuation. Uh, in fact, though, d4, I believe, is probably the best move. But after f takes d6, I think the best is just to take back to the f pawn. And I had seen this, okay, but I thought, man, you know, he's opened the f file. I put my bishop probably on the wrong diagonal. It probably belongs back on c8. Uh, this pawn on e6 is weak, but my judgment was wrong. This is actually playable for black. Taking the piece, on the other hand, is extremely risky. And I just had no feel for the initiative here after this. White has incredible compensation for the piece. I'm not saying he's winning, but this is just very difficult for, for black to play. But in my mind, you know, I thought a piece was a piece, I could probably defend this. So I what some, uh, yeah. Um, after you after you take, um, what prevents okay. Queen to A five H five? Okay, that's fair. I'm oh, sorry, take here. Right here, queen h5? Uh, before, uh, take uh, fe. Okay, this one? And then queen to h5. Yeah, he could play that. Um, it's not clear that that's, it's the best time to play it though, because uh, g6. He can, he can g6, you give yeah. your king, yeah, you give your king a little bit of an escape square here. Uh, it's best here simply to play knight f3 in, in the castle and force black to deal with the fact that he's suddenly got a rook looking down on him. Um, I played something similar. After f5, I played b4, which is actually one of the worst moves you could possibly play. It turns out. And he took there, and I figured I'd better grab the material, so I grabbed the material he took here and I took here. And I, I'm not saying I was confident in this position at all, but my understanding of material, the value of material back then was just awful. And I really thought I could weather the storm. But he played a very good move here, played knight f3. Okay. Like I said, queen h5, g6 actually just helps black. Knight f3. And here I must have thought for 45 minutes, maybe an hour, I don't know. I thought forever. And I could not find any reasonable moves already. Very difficult. I ended up playing knight f6 which was bad, and I, I saw the reason why right after I made the move, of course. <laughs> so uh, what do you think would uh, refute knight f6? Any guesses? I'd probably castle here. And castling is possible. <clears throat> Then they have to worry about a pin on the knight. Yeah, I, if if it were me, I'd be playing bishop to g5 and then push a pawn. Okay, a bishop g5 is possible, but the um, it's possible, but it might be hit by h6. Actually, I don't know. It's tough to tough to say. Um, it, I would look for more, actually, even more aggressive ways to play. I'm thinking e5. Yeah, I believe e5 is the move. That's right. Very good. e5 is absolutely the move, and I saw it as soon as I let go in the nine and f6. Um, that, so here, after e5, I mean, what on earth can I play? You know, I have to. If I retreat the knight, just terrible as you see. Like for instance, say I play there. And he can even continue with e6. <laughs> and this is what I saw. And I saw after king takes e6, my god, that king is just going to get caught in the crosshairs. This, this is just untenable. So very good job. That was nice, uh, nice call. Um, instead, my opponent actually made a mistake. He played knight g5 check, which looks very natural. And then after king g8, he played e5 then. And here, this position showed a complete lack of understanding on my part. This, this is so embarrassing, it's ridiculous. Um, what do you think Black should play here? He has only one move.
Any How about e e six? Um. Wait, wait for what? For black? I uh, no. Um. For black? Uh, yeah. H6. Okay, now why would you play H6? Just curious. Drive the knight out. Yeah, and you're willing to trade the knights. He takes oh, H6, yeah. he takes F6. You're going to take on G5? Yes. Okay. All right, that shows really good judgment. Absolutely. Nice. H6 is the only move. You know, I, I believe during the game, if I remember right, I was thinking to myself, it just was so, uh, let's say, so much anathema to me, or whatever you call it, it's just so uh, distasteful to me to allow my pawn structure, especially around my king, be uh, compromised so much. I wouldn't even let myself consider this move. But black has to make a stand and start fighting back, or else he's just going to get slaughtered. So after h6, uh, the game actually continues. And believe it or not, it's completely unclear. Okay, so white went from winning to not winning here. But me, uh, I didn't, I, I couldn't bring myself to play that move. And I played this awful, awful move, uh, knight e8. All right, now the problem with this move, looking at it, it should be obvious in general without even calculating anything that putting all your pieces on the back rank is not the way to play chess. <laughs> um, but it has a very specific problem too. and. Uh, Balin finished off the game very nicely. He castled. I played C takes B2. The lack of any other ideas is another another mistake. I could have held out a little longer. And he played this nice move, Queen F3. He didn't care about material, which is the right attitude. And obviously, he's going to come down and try to mate me on F7. Um, so honestly, what the hell can I do? Well. I didn't pick a very good move. I picked queen e7. And uh, it's now mating a couple. Well, three, I guess. Uh, can anybody find the mate? Queen takes e4. Or queen takes d5, sorry. That's right. What was that? Yeah, OK. Yep, queen takes d5. And the sad thing is, I remember at the board, I didn't even see it coming, which was really embarrassing. Uh, after that, I resigned. There was no, there was no stopping checkmate. So this game made me realize that I really had no concept whatsoever about how to handle the initiative for either side. Um, the big thing was I overvalued material. And the second thing was I clearly had no idea about how to uh, you know, not worry about structure and other aesthetics when you're fighting for your life. This 98 retraction move was just awful. Okay. So that's this is a uh, game that actually inspired me to hire a coach to try to improve in this area and others. So if we move on, I'm going to get another example and show you how hard it is to uh, play the initiative for me at least. And maybe some of you guys have the similar problem. Who knows? Uh, all right, so this was in the National Open, um, I think also in 2017. Maybe 2018, I can't remember. Um, it was against Alec Anderson, who was a young 2200 player at the time. He's probably 16, I think. And uh, we played this variation of Grunfeld. Now I'm gonna go through this a little differently. Instead of going move by move, I wanna show you the general flow of the game and then talk about the way I thought about it and how it was wrong and show you, then retract it and show what I should have thought. So I played this, this uh, Grunfeld line I was white, and I played this uh, odd line where you pick first, and then you play bishop g5 next. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about the Grunfeld, but the idea is this. There's a line that starts with bishop g5, okay, and the old way black used to play it is to play knight e4, and after bishop h4, he would um, take on c3, take back and then he plays c5, allowing you to take on d5 and you get something like this. And it's a very pleasant position for white. Black can equalize, but white's center is solid, more solid than a normal Grunfeld. 
And uh, it turns out white can press for advantage in various ways. Not so bad. Uh, what's stopped this whole line from being popular anymore is that after bishop g5, knight e4, bishop h4, black has started playing this move, d takes c4. And black can actually hang on to that pawn and cause white all kinds of difficulties, and white's score from here is something like 45%. So the idea behind the move order of the game, where you take here first and then play bishop g5, is to avoid the d takes c4 stuff. And now if black were to play knight takes and then say oh, oh or c5, you get this same structure that you're looking for. There's one drawback though, and that's that if black knows what he's doing after bishop g5, he can play c5 right away. Okay. And then after white plays rook c1, instead of going into the end game type line, he can actually play this good move knight c6. And you'll see the difference here. Uh, the best for white now is to play knight takes d5. And after queen takes d5, you take the c5 pawn, but then queen takes a2. And here, black gets a much sharper game where white is best off sacrificing a pawn. So we can see that, all right, so clearly already the battle lines have been drawn. And to get anything out of position, white has to sacrifice that b2 pawn for an initiative. And back then, when my initiative skills were terrible, this was a frightening experience for me. So I figured here I am playing a guy who obviously knows his stuff. He knows his line of Grunfeld. He's a Grunfeld player anyway, so he's a, probably a very dynamic player. He's young, so he probably calculates better than I do. And uh, here we go into a position that I know I don't play very well. And sure enough, it didn't go very well. If we look at the game, I played natural moves. In fact, I knew theory, for what it's worth, following a Medmetyrov game up to here. Then he played h6 and I was out of book. So I played all natural moves, bishop h4, e5, which I thought was odd. I thought, why would he play e5 while his king's still in the center? But that's what he did. And so I castled trying to take advantage of that. And he took, I took back and I'm trying to get this rookie one in, but it's very clumsy because he has plenty of time to castle instead of allowing me to play rookie one check. So that was basically the level of my, uh, my feel for the initiative there. I hope, hope he didn't see it type of chess. Um, and now, of course, my d4 pawn is very weak. I couldn't find anything better than queen a4, stumbling around. He played g5, not even sure he had to, and then he, he was able to take on d4, and suddenly he's two pawns ahead. And I felt like, yeah, with my development, I might have compensation for one pawn, but certainly not two. And you can see how the whole game, I tried the best I could to put pressure on him, but I just couldn't hit anything. I couldn't land any punches. And he's just much better. He, he sacrificed the pawn back to get a very strong A pawn. A um, couple interesting points. Uh, I couldn't grab the, sorry, I couldn't grab the uh, A7 pawn by Rook takes. And why was that? There was a reason. Uh, back rank? Yeah, back rank, of course. Sorry. Thinking on my feet is not a strong suit. So I had to move away. And then even later on, there was a interesting thing here. It was a yeah, h3, that's right. So queen d5, bishop c7. Okay, and here's the other interesting thing. Um, queen d4. And here I noticed that I couldn't play queen takes d4. Um, can anybody see why I can't take the a pawn? Why this loses? plan is after rook takes d4, play rook to b8, and try to try to win that a pawn. I'll even give you the next move. Okay, so now can anybody see what happens if I try to win the A-pawn? Black will play bishop e5. Okay, even stronger. You got the right idea, but... Uh, rook checks, rook to d1 check, and then bishop e5. Exactly. 
yeah, exactly. So unfortunately, my big plan to win back the eighth one was not going to work because of this unfortunate back crank issue. So I ended up having to just go into a, uh, I mean, I stumbled into a bad ending in the eighth one one day. All right. So going back to the beginning, I mean, we went through that game pretty fast. And you saw that I just had no good ideas whatsoever. And it really, really showed. Um, so let's take a closer look, though, and see what I should have been thinking about. The one thing I didn't, didn't use is the one trump that White has in this position. First of all, it is true that Black is playing e5 too early here. He should have played you know, a number of other moves and would have been just fine. Um, and OO is fine. But can anybody identify, just in general, what is White's big trump card here that he has to look out for, that he has to use? What's 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 Black's one big problem? I mean, if the knight wasn't on c6, then queen d8 would be mate. So some sacrifice sacrifice on c6, and uh, d takes e5. Yeah, the only problem with that is a nice idea. I think the problem with it though really is that. Um, Black's only one move from castling, and I just don't see how that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a nice idea, though. Um, how about d5? Yeah, d5 is possible, but instead of naming moves, let's see. What, what is Black's liability here? Uh, it's, it's true in almost every Grunfeld that you allow your queenside pawns to be taken. What, what's Black's problem? Well, you could pin the knight. Uh, not quite. What I'm going after is this guy. He's a little short on squares. Yeah, I mean, the whole point is oh. white, generally in the Grunfeld, what I've learned is that, uh, you know, in fact, I mean, most of the time when I, back then when I sacrificed the pawn, my, my goal was first to get it back okay, in any way possible. <laughs> but the goal when you sacrifice, <laughs> take advantage of the uh, poorly placed pieces from the other side or activate your own pieces. Black's liability in all these Grunfeld lines where he takes on the queen side of the queen is his queen. It can either be used for tempo gain or for, for being trapped, right? Okay, so you have to start getting creative ideas trying to look for ways to trap the damn queen. And interestingly enough, after he takes d4, I just naturally captured back because I was trying to have this lame idea of using the e-file. But can anybody see what I should have played here? Does queen b3 work? Queen to which square? Uh, b3. Well, I don't really want to trade the queens because, uh, you know, the using tempo on, getting tempo on the queen is uh, probably one of my best things I could do. I want to keep the queens on for attacking purposes in this case. I'm How about rook to b5? Queen, yeah. Rook b5 is not bad. Not bad. Uh, at least you're gaining a tempo on the queen, but the problem is that b7 is protected. Uh, the queen moves to, say, a3 or something, and it's not clear what to do next. Maybe bishop b3. Uh, bishop b3, OK, it stops the queen from retreating. Not bad, but you got you get the right idea now. I'm, you're not as not worried like I was about the pawn on d4, so this is good. But OK, so let me ask you this. You guys are suggesting moves with pieces that are already in play. What, what piece has White not gotten into play yet? This guy, right? Sorry, that's not the move. I meant to do this. So can you see any, let's say, uh, quick and aggressive way to get that guy into play? How about queen d3 threatening rook b1? Bingo. Who's, who said that? Nelson? Nelson is no, a genius. No. That's a very good idea. And see, this is the kind of stuff when you, when you start noticing these ideas and you start not worrying so much about material equality or losing pawns, you start noticing these more important initiative ideas. Clearly, this is a great move. The queen goes to d3, you're threatening rook b1, and it really puts black into a bind. In fact, black is completely lost here, believe it or not. Uh, if he plays bishop e4, which 
there's a nice tempo move developing that you don't want to allow. White regains the tempo by playing e4 himself, right? So that doesn't work. And the thing is, let's say the queen goes back to b6. Okay, then uh, at the very least, very least, I have queen e4 check, right? Uh, which would uh, force the king to move. I mean, I, I suppose if he plays bishop e6, for instance, then he probably have discovery with bishop takes e6. Uh, he might might want to play this first. I'm not sure. But you can see how suddenly Black's life is is much more difficult. Um, so in the analysis I had just had Bishop f5, and now it's Bishop f5 e4, and Black is just dead lost. It's true. Even at, let's check out the Queen b6 idea. Um, turn on an engine for a second. A queen. Yeah, queen e4, bishop e6, and rook b5, right? Makes sense. Okay. So consider this. I mean, to me, this whole sequence of moves where I just played sort of natural moves, and at the end of the game, I wonder, what on earth did I do wrong? You know, it, to me, I played all the normal moves, and all of a sudden, I was just lost. Well, the thing is, when you have an initiative, playing normal, the idea of what it is a normal move changes. Now that I look at it, I think a normal move after e takes d4, while well, he's busy taking your pawns, you develop all your pieces, right? And it makes a huge difference. And sure, you can have material, but you'll win the game. So this is a kind of a revolutionary idea for me when I learned these bad lessons and to take it to heart. Uh, so I've got two more, actually a couple more, three more examples of these things that are pretty interesting. Let's see if we can get through them. Um, I'm going to save that. All right, so then I got a chance the next year, amazingly, to play the exact same line. All right, let me uh, actually I'll just enable this. All right, so if we look at this game, this is against Alex Costello, who's another, another young player who's 15 at the time, I think, or maybe 14, I don't know, um, already a 2300 player. Uh, Somebody told me he was just a calculating wizard. Uh, and so I'm playing my lad. This is the line of Grunfeld I had. is the only one I had, really. Uh, so he played it and looked familiar. And of course, I'm hoping maybe he doesn't know it. But sure enough, he goes right back into the critical line. <laughs> and here we are again. So I'm thinking I already had a horrible experience against Alex Anderson, but at least I learned from that. And I'm playing another whiz kid in the same line. Let's see, see what happens. I played e3, and this time I played bishop d3 instead of bishop c4, only because uh, they're they're both reasonable moves. But sometimes a bishop can go to e4 and put a lot of pressure on this diagonal from e4 to a8. Um, all right, so the first really interesting uh, point comes after move 15. This was a good move, by the way. You shouldn't check with the queen here to force the knight to a more passive square. He was aware of this and did it. So the game is completely different now than the Alec Anderson game. I, I won't be able to trap his queen, but he played this bishop d7 move <clears throat> after a long thought. And I thought, well, you know, I really didn't want to take my pawn back because I didn't want to be a just a sacrifice a pawn only to try to win it back. But I, I really couldn't find anything better than rook b5. Uh, I looked at a long line like this, queen c2, rook here and I just I want I looked at this for a long time and couldn't find any any fruitful gains from it. But at least I was calculating a little better and seeing ideas. So instead I played rook d5. He played queen d6 and I took the pawn. Fine. And he played rook a b8. All right. So now thinking about the initiative. Can anybody suggest there are, there are several decent moves here for white? Uh, what would you uh, suggest? Bishop f4. Yeah, bishop f4 is a, is a a very interesting move. Absolutely, absolutely. Because you can see the only reply is e5, right? Right. Okay. And can you see any kind of? Uh, Instead of just taking that pawn, can you see any kind of tempo moves or initiative moves 
after that, after bishop f4, e5? Can you go c4 with your knight? That's right. Then you get another tempo, right? Yeah. And say he goes queen to d5 then. Uh, queen to d5. And you can then go bishop, bishop c4? Well, the knight's on c4. Ah, right. Um, then you can push e4. Okay. Push e4, you get another tempo on the queen. He takes on d4. In fact, I think taking on d4 is the only move, right? Um, right. And, so, uh, now, you might be able to go to a5, actually. Okay. And but if he, goes, if he goes to a5, notice that the bishop on d7 hangs, right? Right. Right. So he has to go to d4, okay? So this is all forcing sequence, right? Okay, and can you continue? Um, he's on d4. Uh, Can you take the bishop? Can you go knight uh, b5? Uh, well, the knight's on c4, so it can't get to b5. Okay, sorry. Yeah, c4. It's okay. Yeah. But can you attack the queen again? Uh, mm, the knight's on c4, queen uh, d4. Yeah, it's on a dark square. What can you use to attack on a dark square? Okay, so you can use the bishop to e3. That's right. Bishop e3. And where can the queen go? So there's a knight on c4, um, bishop on e3. So the queen has to move to e5 or f6. Right, and then the bishop on d7 would hang, right? Right. Exactly. So that's basically what I saw. Now, what I saw there, interestingly enough, is that after bishop b3, I saw that black could actually just play rook takes b7. And after bishop takes queen on d4, knight takes d4. And I realized that, honestly, it was the white had no advantage there. Um, but I figured, hey, you know, it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of stuff in the way. Uh, you know, it's, it's tough for black to give us a queen. It's worth a shot anyway, because otherwise I trap his queen, right? Mm. So, in fact, that's how the game went. So the other thing, though, is to show that I'm seeing more ideas at this point. I also saw this interesting idea of knight e4, uh, like queen d5. And that queen e6, of course, is met by knight c5 forking everything. And then I even saw knight, c, knight, uh, knight c3, queen takes and rook takes. But I thought, eh, it doesn't really look like white has a big advantage here. But in fact, white actually does have a slight advantage here. I, I misjudged this. So as a part of evaluation problem more than a calculation problem. But you're right, absolutely. Um, but what I played in the game was bishop f4, e5. Now, let's talk about this position here, because I did play knight c4. But I also looked at another continuation. I looked at just what happens if I trade on, uh, on e5 after, well, I played knight c4, but after queen d5, I also looked at trading on e5. And what do you guys think about trading on e5, this mass trades? Like uh, first maybe rook takes b8 and then taking everything on e5. <laughs> Looks like you're opening it up for black. It does, doesn't it? By the way, I, I'm, I apologize if I get people's names wrong. It's not clear to me who's talking here, so. Uh, if I call somebody by the wrong name, I apologize. Yeah, so if you think about it, say I do massive wholesale trades, it seemed to me that I would end up with black having more active pieces than white, and especially because this rook on f1 has not gotten into play yet, right? But in fact, this is one, one place where my calculation failed me. Um, if I do play this line, we'll follow it along and just trade everything on e5. Can you see anything now that makes you change your mind about this? That uh, rook pawn on the A rank. That's true, but is, is anything in black's position hanging? Does the bishop takes g6 uh, win a pawn? Exactly. Very nice. Yes. 
Hmm. And I missed that. I missed that because I did not let myself calculate it. I did not allow myself to actually think about Texas there because I thought in this position that look at Black's pieces. They're so much more in the game and active than mine. I just missed this whole line without even <coughs> looking at the position. And if you look at the position, you'll see you have Bishop takes G6. And after Sage takes, Queen takes, White has one a pawn. Now, to be honest, Black has pretty decent compensation because his A pawn is so strong. The chances of White winning this are pretty slim. However, I'd rather have seen it and evaluated it and missed it all together. You know what I mean? These are the kind of things you have to do when you're working an initiative problem is throw out these generalizations such as, oh, his pieces are better than mine. You have to look at very specific things, very concrete. And I didn't. So instead, I played the line we were talking about. I played this e4 idea. And uh, he played queen takes d4, which is forced because he has to stay on his bishop. And then I played bishop b3. And I was kind of sad because I, I was pretty sure he could just play rook take b7. And in fact, it's true. Rook takes b7, sacrificing the queen, is a good move. I take here, he takes here. And black has a pawn knight, a pawn bishop and rook, rather, for the queen. And uh, I judge this as perfectly fine for black. In fact, I was a little bit worried about white because white has no targets here. And the odd thing is, it's funny. So the, the player I was playing, we, we actually did talk after the game. We went over the game. And uh, he didn't even consider this as an option because he said he just doesn't like giving up his queen. So it goes to show that, you know, calculators like him have certain issues too, that they, they also have biases that affect their games. But anyway, in this position here, after bishop b3, he wheeled off a move I just didn't even consider. He played bishop g4. And it took me a moment to see the idea. Does anybody see the idea? I mean, clearly the most obvious move is to play f3 here. And then you're attacking the bishop and the queen, <laughs> right? So can anybody see what Black's idea is? So I'll even put in the next move, I'll put an F3. Hey, Jeff, can you unmute um, Malay? Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't realize he was muting. Okay, everybody should be unmuting. Thanks. Uh, sorry about that. No problem. Yep, I apologize, Malay. Yeah, so try to think of what Black could possibly be thinking by playing bishop g4, allowing f3. So Jeff, this is Brian, queen c3, and then after the rook trade, then there's the threat of rook d8, pinning that's the right to the queen. Very nice. Thank you for telling me. I recognize your voice, though. That's good. <laughs> Thanks for telling me who we are anyway. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely right. Black's idea is after f3 to play queen c3, and then after I take the bishop or whatever, you know, eventually he wants to play rook d8, pinning and winning the d3 bishop back. And I saw that pretty quickly and thought to myself, gosh, boy, that's clever. And uh, I had about 20 minutes left on my clock and it was, I think, I can't remember what, what I don't know what move this was, but anyway, the, the thing is though, I, I remember distinctly feeling that I'd gotten this far and hadn't screwed up the position. I was really worried about, uh, you know, failing at this point and um, bad mindset. Uh, and I saw a very safe continuation and it really was hard for me to calculate uh, based on because I'd already found a safe way to get to a very drawish position, um, which I felt was a somewhat of an achievement because he was higher rated and I was playing on a line that I was very uncomfortable with at the time. So anyway, but the thing is, I really should have buckled down and started calculating. Let's see if we can figure this position out because believe it or not, there is a, a clear win for white. 
and it's not easy. Okay. Very, very impressive though. All right, so first of all, uh, let's play F3, and then we play Queen C3. Okay. Now we know taking the bishop is probably not very good because of uh, because of the uh, eventually the rook coming to d8. But let's try to see if we can figure out some some key ideas here. Does anybody have any kind of suggestions or any observations about this position that make it interesting? Well, the black queen is still short of squares. Mm -hmm. That is true. Something I completely failed to notice during the game. Yeah, so let's start with this. Let's let me ask you this very specific question. If white were to play rook takes b8 right now, how should black capture back? Well, Let's say he takes back to the rook. Can you see the problem with taking back to the rook? That leaves your f7 pawn weak. It's true, actually. In fact, I remember calculating that, um, you know, trying to play uh, f takes g4 and queen f3 and attacking the f7 pawn. Uh, it is true, actually. But uh, that's where I got kind of stuck and was, it was unclear. We can actually look at those variations in a second, but there's something much more clear after rook takes b8, rook takes b8. Can anybody find it? Uh, loose pieces on the C file. Yeah, that's, that's definitely part of it. So if you think about it, we know that after F takes G4, to maintain any kind of material equality, uh, Black has to play Rook D8, right? And he's counting on the fact that he's got the pin on the, the bishop. So the question is, is there anything loose you can gain tempo on? Does uh, Queen A4 work? Exactly. Queen A4 hits the loose knight on C6, right? It's not quite over yet because, uh, well, I'll show you. But it, it works out for white only because it, you have to see the next level of tactic here. Um, because after rook takes, notice the knight is pinned. You can't take back. But we have this intermediate move, queen e8 check, which wins the game. So, very good suggestion. That was a combination of people. It's nice. So it's, it's important when you're calculating these positions to make observations like this. Because think about it, if you take the rook, then black has to take back with the knight, right? And clearly that deactivates his knight and keeps his rook on f8 deactivated. It's promising, right? You might as well look at it and see if you can use that to your advantage. Okay. So let's assume that we play rook takes b8, knight has to take back, knight takes b8. What next? Knight takes e5. Okay, after knight takes e5, how would you respond to bishop takes e5? Mm, rook to f3. Well, the, the pawn's still on f3. We haven't taken the, uh, the bishop yet. Oh, okay. Uh, That's okay, though. But somebody mentioned before an important observation. So we've got two observations. One is when we take the rook on b8, the knight has to take back, which is clearly favorable for white. But the other thing is somebody mentioned the queen is short of squares here. Where can the queen go?
I mean, after the exchange, the only place it can go is B4, right? So can anybody find a move that cordons off the queen? All right, so the answer is queen b1. The idea is to not only get out of this pin on the d file, but to cut off the b4 square from the queen, and white is suddenly threatening rook c1, trapping the queen. Amazing stuff. So if I had noticed this, which I did not in the game, I could have played rook b8, yes, take back on the knight, and queen b1, which is, sorry, an incredible move. And black is suddenly has a queen trap. So he has to fight to try to get squares to the queen. But because we drove his knight back, he's one move too short. So he's rook d8. I actually have time to drop the bishop back to e2. <laughs> uh, because I'm still threatening rook c1 trapping the queen. And he tries to come to the rescue with knight c6. So now on rook c1, we go knight d4. And he's, if I take on c3, at least he has knight takes e2 check. But then we can calmly just drop our bishop back to f1 and the queen is done. He has to trade. And because he has, he has to save his queen, we have time to take the bishop on g4 and we win. Amazing stuff, huh? But the reason I didn't, well, there are multiple reasons why I didn't find this, but the biggest one is I was so worried about the result of the game, I didn't actually allow myself to look. Um, so I never got this far, but I thought that was an amazing thing. Um, the lesson there is, is to not believe your opponent just because they play a move confidently and to, to buckle down and stop worrying about results of the game and try to find interesting ideas or observations to work with. Okay, so anyway, the game ended this way. I played this lame bishop d4 move. He took my queen, I took his rook, he took back, I took the a pawn, unloaded and got the bishop back. And we got to this dead draw in position and pulled around for a couple moves and called it a draw. Okay, not spectacular, but hey, we can see some improvement, right? I didn't lose. <laughs> um, I held my own. I had some ideas finally, right? And okay, maybe I missed the big one at the end, but uh, clearly this is a little, little bit better than what I've done previously, right? Okay, so let's let's keep going. Uh, there's one more example. I have a couple more, but I'm going to stop at one of uh, my sort of limitations in education in the end. And then we're going to go on to... I'll kind of turn it into a couple of successes here. The next game is against Teddy Wen, who's a young kid, in California, who Brian knows. And uh, let me, uh, yeah, after 17, 16, Queen C6. So here we go. He's a, he's a, already a 2200 player. He's only 13 years old. Um, very good with the initiative, actually, at, at, as it turns out. Uh, maybe not so hot in the opening, but he played this. Uh, very solid selector Slav, which may, you may know, and played down the main line. I think I could have played bishop d3 there, but it transposed because of d takes c4. I hadn't played against a selector in a long time. So here the prescribed method is to play the, the what black does is exchanges his bishop nine nine three, and then plays for a quick e5 where he's trying to just basically um, uh, liquidate in the center and activate his pieces. And the idea is he wants to be left with an open center where this guy is better than this guy. And if you don't play actively as white, you can actually find yourself worse pretty quickly in this silly opening. So he plays knight d7 because what he wants to do is play e5. Simple enough. Oops. What's going on here? All right, something happened. Okay. Yep. So the prescription is to play rook d1. So at least you're ready for the default open. Play e5, and then instead of taking, what white's supposed to do is play d5. And the main line here is for black actually to do a temporary pawn sacrifice with e4, and it turns out to be a very drawish position where white ends up trying to squeeze some advantage in the game. But he played a very suspicious move here. He played, he didn't know the theory, so he played e takes, c takes d5. Um, and I actually, white can take with either piece. I took with the knight. The bishop actually 
might be better. And he played knight b6. <clears throat> and I thought for a little while, and I couldn't find anything better than knight takes b6, but it's a good move. He took for the queen. Yeah, that's all fine. And you can see already that white's only problem right now is this bishop. If White can solve the problem of this bishop, he's got the two bishops. Yeah, it's a symmetrical position, but hey, um, you know, what, what do you want against a solid opening like this? Uh, so in order to help develop that bishop, I played e4, which is fine. Okay. It gives the bishop an avenue. Uh, also gains space and stops him from playing e4. My bishop, and I played d3. And here, he attacked my e-pawn with queen c6. All right, now I'd like to stop here and like people to give me the thoughts on this position. For you to play, what would you play here for white? This up a three for a tempo. Hey, that you're absolutely thinking in the right direction. Okay. Now, if he plays, say, uh, rook and f two d eight, what would you play then? Very nice, by the way. Not sure. I'd either exchange or exchange and then rook to e one. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, good. That's that's very instructive. Thanks for, for uh, pointing that out. I see what you're saying. Uh, I'm glad you recognize that obviously the e-pawn is under attack. But you had the same failing and thought that I did during the game. Uh, you know, I didn't want to lose a center pawn, okay, especially a center pawn that might allow his bishop to open up if they can then dump his pawn with e4 or something. So I wanted to cling to this e4 pawn. Um, so your idea is bishop a3 and after rook d8, Perhaps exchange and then play rookie one. So something like this. Okay. So the problem is that, you know, white actually probably is okay here still for sure, but you've passively put your rook defending the e pawn. Ideally, we'd like to do something a little better, right? Can we try? Bishop g5, and there's a couple of lines, lines, right? So if queen takes e4, that loses a piece after bishop takes... Actually, no, you can, you're going to take on f3. That's right. I was going to say knight takes c4, bishop d5, knight takes g5, bishop takes c6, knight takes f3, bishop takes mm -hmm. f3, wins a piece for... No, it's still equal. Never mind. It's I'm thinking out loud. You lost a pawn, actually, yeah. Did I? Yeah. Yeah. But that's okay. I that's... thought I was winning a piece, but... No. But, but Melly's right. I mean, you got to start looking at stuff like that, right? I uh, have the two bishops. I'd much rather have the initiative the pawn. Now, I didn't understand this at the time, but let's continue on with this bishop a3 idea, though. Um, bishop a3, what would you play on rook fd8, though? <laughs> our goal is to activate our pieces, even at the expense of the e4 pawn. How about swapping rooks and then playing bishop d5? Okay. Uh, Followed by rook to d1. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, if you do that, though, you're giving black control the d file. So rook takes, d, rook takes d8. Bishop to d5. He's got three attackers on the square. He can play knight takes d5. You can pin it with rook d8. I do agree um, with that. So that's that's certainly it's certainly a possibility. But the the one thing I don't like about it is giving up the D file. It, it certainly doesn't sound like a bad suggestion at all. But let's see if we can actually uh, activate our pieces instead of Black's pieces. So next suggestion. Well, let's try again. Can you start with D five, Bishop D five? Uh, yeah, you might be able to because you have enough uh, defenders on that, and you might get a pass pawn. Of course, you do have to watch out for than him pushing e4, but that might be okay. I mean, you're, you're suggesting bishop d5. Uh, no, I was suggesting bishop d5 before uh, we played bishop a3. Oh, before bishop a3, okay. Yeah. 
Well, honestly, I, I don't like that as much because you're talking about moving pieces before you have your other guys off the mat, right? You've got this rook on a1 and bishop on a3 on c1. Right. I really would like to get those in play before starting operations like bishop d5. Right. Um, I mean, you know, you might even be hit with queen c3. Well, you lose the b7 pawn. Mm, not clear. Actually, okay, so I, I would probably end up playing knight takes d5 and rook takes d5, probably, and then maybe even queen c3. And it's not clear white has any advantage there whatsoever. Um, but it's not terrible. It's certainly not a terrible idea. Think black can do queen takes rook play. there. What was that? Think black can do queen takes rook there, actually. Okay, thanks. Just pretty cool line. So you're talking about knight takes d5? Yeah, rook takes, and then queen takes rook. Oh, and win the rook on a1? That's an idea, yeah. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Yeah, see that? Gabe pointed out a very nice idea, as he usually does. Um, that uh, it highlights the idea of not developing your pieces, right? If you right. that drawback of not developing your pieces, stuff like this happens to you. Good point. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's check it out. I mean, after Bishop A3, Rook F D8, instead of giving up the D file, let's see if we can actually use our active pieces. The rook move is Bishop E7. Okay, now. Black's going to have to give up something. You know, for instance, say he plays something really silly like rook e8, then we really have to, he has to watch out because we have rook d6 with our active pieces, right? We get to use the d file. And suddenly this f6 knight is looking very, very scared. Um, so after bishop e7, rather, sorry. Uh, you know, he, the normal move is, is, the best move is just to take, take, and then he can take the e pawn. Okay, and this is what I was worried about. That's why I didn't even really look at this line. But if we just think about it for a second, objectively, it's just a pawn. And after queen takes, knight takes, you get to play a move like rook to d7. And look at all of white's pieces compared to black's. Okay. Um, the rook is extremely active on the seventh rank. I've got the two bishops. And, uh, you know, what more do you need? You know, this should have been for a, for a person who's experienced and understands the initiative. This is an easy evaluation for him. This is just much better for white. And in fact, if you turn on the engine, it'll prove it. So it says about plus one. And honestly, in human terms, it's much worse because playing against these active pieces is very, very difficult. Does that make sense to everybody? And uh, let's see, the game could go, in fact, with best play, it looks like this. He has to play b5, ditching a pawn back just to get his pieces in play. Rook c1 to h5. Like I said, this is best play, but the bishop just returns to c4. And now suddenly you've got issues. Bishop takes f7, and check is a threat now because, it's, well, it might be a threat. There's a bishop a3 check, but maybe not. Uh, knight takes f2, bishop h4, tempo. The king can't get trapped, and white just ends up with a winning advantage in the end game. So that's a, a really good example about the types of things you should be looking for in a position to create an initiative. Instead, look what I played. I played bishop e3. By the way, yeah, bishop e3. Um, I was okay with giving up the e pawn as long as I got the a pawn in return. And he, he had none of it. He just played b6. And even here, I could have played another way of giving up a pawn for an initiative, but I chose to play the horrible, horrible bishop to d3. Okay. Looking at it now, I'm just shocked that I was so, so inept. But the idea is playing passively just to protect your material, it should be the last thing on your mind. Um, and after this, he actually slowly untangled and got a better game. And when it came his chance to take the initiative, he didn't blink. What I should have played here is rook a c1, threatening bishop f7 check. Okay, keeping on the run. And after taking on e4, which is a mistake, okay, you take, take, and then we play rook to d7. Very simple chess. 
But White's active pieces, once again, win. And you might be wondering, well, okay, the rook on c1 is held, but uh, this is what White should go for. Activity above all else. So instead, watch how slowly I got outplayed here. Played rook d8, rook c1. Uh, and here's my fantastic idea to once and all, for all protect e4 with f3, <laughs> which, which is utterly ridiculous because that weakens all these dark squares around my king and he can start using it with moves like knight h5, f4. So my whole concept in this position was completely wrong. I realized that uh, I wanted to play bishop c4 here, but that would hang the e-pawn. I ended up playing bishop c2. Queen b4, he starts threatening the e-pawn again. Very good play by my young opponent. Played f3, he goes knight h5. Uh-oh, things are starting to happen. He keeps the rook on with rook c8. I, I play this bishop b1, and look at my pieces now. Okay, I have material quality, but compare that to the positions I could have gotten if I had sacked the e-pawn, and it's not even close, right? Now, I, very smartly, his idea here is to play bishop c5 and trade off my only defender of the dark squares. And I realize that I'll be left with this pathetic thing against this great knight. And plus all of Black's other pieces are better as well. And no real thing. I tried to trade queens to get into an end game and activate my queen because he, he decided not to trade smartly. Great move, rook c3. Activating his rook. Two, and then uh, played the move I'd didn't, I didn't really expect. And now I only had one move to stay in the game and I didn't find it. Uh, I played king h2. Uh, to me, king h1 looked ridiculous because you're inviting knight g3, but that was the only move. And can anybody find <laughs> the idea here for black? Rook takes f3, yeah? Exactly, rook takes f3, very nice. Yep. Uh, we're getting, my only excuse here is we're getting toward, toward time control. But the problem is that Black, White's obviously been on his heels for many moves because he decided not to have the initiative, he decided to give it to his opponent. And uh, then things like this happen. These, these are accidents that are based on pressure, right? So I played a, tried to play a clever move. Obviously, um, taking is out of the question. Whether we take and queen f2 and whoops. This is one reason why King G1, King H1 was better because Queen F2 didn't come with check, believe it or not. Um, so I played Bishop D4, hoping to distract the Queen from getting to F2. But he, he, once he got the initiative here, he didn't let it go. He played very well. Queen F2. Uh, should have played Bishop B1 and played Queen C8. I really had no idea what else to do. Then Rook takes H3. Very nice move. Now here, he's, he's willing to sacrifice material to get a huge initiative against me. Um, <clears throat> you know, clearly, I can't take with the king because I'm made on g3. I can't take with the pawn. I have to take with the queen. And what has he gotten for this? He's got the bishop, and he understands that even though he's down in exchange, he's controlling, he's dominating the dark squares. And I mean, clearly shows that he understands the concept of the initiative much better than I did. There's no it's actually up material, right? Because he, yeah. he has two two pawns for it as well. Yeah, that's probably true, but I, I don't even think that matters. The The point is the dark squares are just too weak in his active pieces. Yeah, you're right, though. Technically, he's probably even ahead of material. Um, and watch how he finished me off. He just did a great job. I mean, nothing spectacular. Uh, and I just, I hung, well, I hung a rook on purpose because the game was over. There's nothing you can do here. I'm just completely toast. So I played a silly move at the end just for fun. <clears throat> All right, so that ends the chapter on my follies. Uh, clearly, I had a lot to learn. I started to learn some things over that time. You saw I getting a little better at certain things, but other stuff, not so much. But I worked on it a lot, um, not only with my coach, but I, I uh, got a book by Judith Polgar. Uh, I worked with some of my friends on it. I got a great book by Julia Savage named... Um, Beyond Material, I don't know if you've seen that book, but it, it gives a lot of examples about initiative-based positions. And finally, it started a turnaround, and this is my, my kind of turnaround game. So this is Chicago Open, can't remember which year, but 
Um, I'm playing a, a young kid. He's 14 years old. He's 23.70 feet A at the time. Um, and you know, one of my problems with the, the, my chess skills lacking is that I, uh, you know, lack of tactical ability and initiative play is that uh, I really had a hard time beating higher rated players. And the reason is that it's kind of like being a pitcher without a strikeout pitch. You can get to good positions, but you can't put them away because they don't hold like lower rated players do. If you're playing a person lower rated, you know, there's a good chance to get a good position. They're just going to collapse. But when you're playing people 200 points higher than you, it's not so easy. They, they put up stiff resistance and you usually have to come to some kind of tactical solution <laughs> to win the game. And uh, that was just not my repertoire. So let's see if I can apply the lessons I've learned in this game. That was White. Okay. He played, he played this very interesting line of the slot defense called the Argentinian variation. D takes C4. So here we go. Um, after this, there's really not many ways for White to keep a quiet game. So you have to kind of meet it head on and take a bull by the horns and play active chess. Uh, you can play E4, but I like this E3 idea. No idea why I have that arrow, and it's pretty obvious I'm trying to take back my C4. Um, and he, of course, tries to keep his pawn for as long as possible. After A4, master move. B4, play 94. Now, the normal move, you know, which I've seen before, <laughs> is to play queen d5. He played here. Okay. And then I played knight to g3. And uh, now I've seen in, in most games, the most popular move by far is knight f6. And after knight f6, there are many lines where white sacrifices one, two, even three pawns to get uh, an issue. Uh, and the main move here is bishop e2. Leads to just wild position. I've had a game here the year before, which was just uh, crazy. Um, but he didn't play that. I guess because I'm a lower rated player, he wanted to get some kind of uh, out of theory game, make me think on my own. He played bishop a6. <laughs> it's something like the fourth most popular move in this position. I never faced it, didn't know anything about it. So I'm on my own here. And so I figure, okay, look, he hasn't developed his king side at all, right? So, you know, I have a nice center. Yeah, I'm down a pawn, but why don't I just try to develop and get some kind of initiative by getting my pieces in play faster than he can? So I play e4, and I found out later that typically people play queen a5 here, but he played queen to d8. All right, so I continue just developing. I want to get my pieces out, like I said. And he played another move that's a little unusual. He played e6. And I surmise that the reason he played an early e6 here instead of knight f6 or something like that must be because he wants to play c5 quickly. But I thought, okay, if he plays c5, let him, because certainly what about these guys, you know? <laughs> and one of the most important things when you're talking about playing for initiative is when you see a guy lagging behind in development, you've got to start thinking about ways to trap his king in the center and, and use that, even at all costs, even at cost of a piece. Okay, so I started looking around at ideas for this kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, there's nothing right away. Uh, you know, I'm not developed enough to play d5 or anything like that and blast open the position. So I just played bishop b2. He did play c5, which surprised me because, once again, he's not developing. And Let's see, this, what move was this? This was, uh, gotta be careful here. Hang on one sec. Ah. Okay, so I castle, and he finally played knight f6. All right, so here's the question. How would you continue in this position if you're white? Any ideas? 
is sub G5. Okay, and why would you suggest that? What's the uh, reasoning? Develops the bishop, allows you to play rook on C1 later. Okay, that's, that's definitely one idea, yep. Uh, okay, um, and what about if he just plays H6 there? What are you gonna do? Um, guess I'll have to uh, trade. Is that a good idea, trading your bishop for a knight? I personally don't like bishops. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. What do they ever do to you? Um, <laughs> okay, well, I like knight to e5. Well, knight to e5, I'm a little worried about my d4 square collapsing. Yeah, but you're also attacking on the counterattacking on the c4 square. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But actually, that, that leads to, that's a very interesting point. I'm glad you brought it up. I want to answer this bishop g5 thing uh, for a second, then I'll get back to this. Um, yeah, so, okay, so bishop g5 actually is, is a pretty decent move. Uh, I was thinking about it in terms, well, slightly different terms than being able to play rook c1. I'll explain my thought process in a minute. But after h6, in fact, bishop takes f6 is exactly the right move. And the reason is that h6 is another waste of tempo, and you don't want to give him a chance to, uh, to gain the tempo back by retreating your bishop. And in fact, the idea then is you have, after bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, you have ideas of <coughs> f5, I'm sorry, e5 rather, and further tempo gain. And that's, at this point, it's all a tempo game. You just want to get as much, as many tempi and as much initiative as possible. So you can't be worried in this position about having to trade a bishop for a knight. Even if you did like a uh, bishop more than a knight. Uh, and what's the intention after bishop e7 as opposed to h6? Yeah, good question. Okay, we can look at that. Um, so at the very least, you have uh, stuff, ideas like e5 training the bishops and playing knight e4 and knight to d6. Um, that, that can be a pretty powerful plan, especially since you've hardly invested in any material. Uh, the dark squares are right. Yeah. Um, but actually, my first thought in this position was similar to what the other uh, gentleman said. I'm afraid I don't know all the names. apologize. But um, he thought of this idea of knight e5 uh, with the idea of regaining the pawn on c4. My first thought actually was to play queen c2 uh, with a similar idea because knowing me, as you do, my first thoughts are if you sack a pawn, first objective is to get it back, right? <laughs> as stupid as it is. But even I was able to convince myself this was dumb because black can actually develop quickly and oppose my queen on the c file. And this is the line I'm calculating. We see here that Despite, I mean, th th this line for white clearly shows that he's missed the mark. I mean, he's, his advantage in development has almost evaporated, and it didn't matter as much anyway because we've gotten to an endgame where black's king actually might be better off in the center. I thought black would be let off way too easily here. So, in fact, I did play bishop g5. Very good move. So, Let's see if we can figure out what happens on these things. So if, in fact, uh, after h6, we do indeed trade because it's a tempo game. We're just trying not to give them a chance to breathe. We don't want to retreat and give them time. And we play rook c1 then. Not, not really just to regain the c4 pawn, but the idea is now black almost is missing one, tempi, one tempo he needs to try to avoid infiltration here. We can use a c file to, to uh, invade. So he plays knight c6, e5, and you see he's almost one tempo short. We can even trade queens, and then we get in this beautiful knight e4 move before he can actually develop. This is a good variation to illustrate that black just doesn't have enough time. He's down one, one or two moves short from really organizing his pieces. And onto uh, the other suggestion of Melly of bishop e7 which was a move I kind of expected, e5, knight d5, play bishop takes, queen takes, and knight e4. And because of the hit on the c5 pawn, 
Um, Black doesn't have time to both castle and save the pawn, and knight d6 check is coming soon. So clearly we can see the ramifications of not developing for Black and how White has to play very energetically to try to take advantage of this stuff. I played bishop e5. Let me, uh, I want to make sure I can move the mouse wheel on this one. Okay. All right, and he played knight c6. I was shocked at this point. I thought, how can you possibly delay your kingside development so long? Now, clearly, he's trying to fake me out into worrying about my, my, my loose pawns in the center or something. I really don't know. But now you got to start kind of salivating <laughs> or foaming at the mouth uh, if you want to be a good attacker and figure out, okay, look, the king is in the center. Clearly it's highlighted here. we got to start looking at ways to take advantage of that before he can castle, right? So what would you play here as white? D5. Okay, D5 and say he takes it, he takes D5. Yeah, break open the e file a little bit. Okay, yeah, you take e takes d5. Yep. Yeah, that's probably not bad. Uh, he might play maybe knight d4 there. And his whole idea is to get, uh, in, say, bishop, if he can, bishop d6 and castle. It's probably not bad for white actually. What if he just takes bishop? times f6, and then d5. d5, actually, once again, not, probably not a bad, bad idea at all. Um, in that case, I bet you after d5, he'd probably play knight to d4. And he'd love to trade queens if you play knight takes, queen takes, that kind of thing. Play e5 there, he has an intermezzo with knight takes. I got to watch out for the rook on a8, but... It's not clear, but he might, he might have knight takes f3 and queen takes e5, and after d takes e6, he might be able to move the rook. Pretty tricky, though. But there's another very common idea, like thematic idea, here. Um, after d5, e takes d5. Has anybody seen it? Well, what, what else can white do? Uh, there's e5. Yeah, exactly. And what does that do? It captures a knight. It's pinned. It's pinned. Okay, good. Yeah, it's pinned. Attacking the pinned knight, right? So White's given up a second pawn, but the e5 move actually attacks that f6 knight that is pinned. And what is Black's forced answer? What does he have to do then? Well, he has to get something back from it, so probably take the pawn. Well, no, don't forget it's his move. So we have d5, he takes d5, e5, it's Black's move. What does he have to do? He has to play h6, right? Just like in that move, uh, that game against Byron Lee from the. Oh, yes. He has to counterattack or else he's just going to lose the knight, right? Okay. But then after h6, notice that we can play e takes f6. And what, what have we achieved? We've actually opened up the e file, right? Okay. To get his material back, he has to play h takes g5. And then can you find a continuation in that position for white? What would you play then? So whoever's uh, munching potato chips over there, can you just mute your microphone while you're munching? Thank you. Yeah, so we're talking about the line with d5. He takes d5, e5, h6, he takes f6, h takes g5. What do you do then as white? I feel like it's dubious to take g7, because then you're just freeing up that f8 square. Bingo. Very nice. This, this absolutely shows good judgment. Unless you have some specific concrete reason there, um, 
for that to work, yeah, it's probably not the first direction to look at, right? Because it does actually help black get to the point where you can castle, right? And he actually has an open H file too. You got to be slightly worried about being attacked there. <laughs> so we opened the E file. What do we want to do with it? Use it. So maybe rookie one. Yeah, now the bishop's in the way. So do we unload the bishop first? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Um, well, the problem with the problem with that is that if we play bishop takes c4 first, okay, then he takes bishop takes c4, and when we play rook e1 check, he can actually play king d7, and the bishop covers the d5 pawn. Mm. That's a problem. So the whole thing clicked into place for me when I saw rook e1 first. So the moves are d5, e takes d5, e5, h6, e takes f6, G takes H, H takes G5, rook E1, posing the king. Okay. And then the most natural move to me was what? Um, oh, yeah, this is the thing. He can't play king to D7 to get out of this attack because it, it finally dawned on me that I could actually play queen takes D5 check there. And when I realized that I could play queen takes d5 check, that's when I realized the whole thing fell into place. Um, so his king can't run, that's the point. And he can't play anything interposing like bishop e7 because the pawn's in f6. So he's kind of stuck, right? And so that, in fact, was the winning move, winning line. I played d5, he took, played e5, he took, I got to open the e file, he regained material. And this star move, rookie one. It's critical that the d5 pawn is not protected if he plays, tries to run with a king. So I really expect him to play king d7 anyway, because I think it's best. And I calculated out <coughs> takes d5, check king c7, and queen takes f7, check here. And then I thought there were a lot of interesting moves here, but the one I had settled on in my mind I was going to play is knight takes g5. And white has a serious advantage in this position. Even after the queen trade, it's a big initiative and active pieces. But instead, he surprised me by playing the move here. Instead of king d7, he played knight e7. Okay. I mean, I saw this move, but I dismissed it as not being so good. So what do you play now? Pawn takes knight. Yeah, you absolutely could. There's no doubt. No doubt pawn takes knight is a reasonable move. Then bishop takes though, and he's potentially ready to castle. If you follow it up correctly, it actually transposes to the game. So it's, it's not a bad suggestion at all. Uh, could you play something like knight to e5? Okay, knight e5. Uh, it's an interesting idea. Um, I didn't really consider it very seriously, actually. Uh, the only thing I wasn't sure how, how to follow it up, I thought he might be able to actually even, say, take on f6. And attack knight. 
it's not entirely clear to me what to do then. How about knight temps g5? Okay, and okay, once that's that's a reasonable suggestion. And uh, after g takes f6, you then have to figure out how to continue. Yeah. Maybe uh, f g7 first. Uh, bishop okay. takes. G7, knight f5, and then the bishop. Uh, well, they're just discovery ideas with the light square bishop. bishop yeah, might, I mean, you might go bishop f6 there, and then you got to figure out how to uh, put pressure on e7, right? Yeah, I didn't see bishop f6. Okay. I mean, maybe something works there. I don't see it off the top of my head. No, I mean, think, think, more, um, think more about stopping him from developing and getting our own initiative. Don't worry about material so much. You're coming close, not quite there. The cool thing is that after my D5 move, which took me some time, I played the rest of the game in 12 minutes. That was fun. So you can play almost, uh, there, was, there was calculation involved, but you can play a lot of it instinctively. We want the e file, right? Right. So clear the e file. How do you clear the e file? Bishop f1. Okay, how about more aggressive? Um, I want to say bishop to c times c5. There you go. Bishop takes c4. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. Clearance, right? I'm sorry. A clearance, a clearance idea, right? Yes. Right. Very good. Yep. And after bishop takes c4, uh, yeah, d takes c4 didn't work either because the rooks come to the d file and e file and kill the king. Okay. Now, simply we take on e7, he takes back, and then we get our knight f5 move, right? That's how the game went. So think about it, okay? I mean, white is still uh, down two pawns, but black can't castle, right? And the serious threat on e7 is coming. And it's not even clear how, how black can defend, right? So he played pretty much all he could do <laughs> at this point. He played king f8. Pretty sad move to have to play, right? All right. So now what's, what do we do? Take the brick to the seventh rank. Okay, we could, yep, absolutely. Let's see, I'm trying to remember what, what I did. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let's see. Yeah, so I took knight takes e7. I took with a knight, actually. All right, now. He's actually down material, but the thing is, what he was counting on is getting some kind of counterplay against my H2 pawn or something. He played this. Okay. He plays G4, and his whole idea is to kick the knight away from F3 and try to use his queen and rook to make some kind of uh, noise on the king side. All right, so here's the question. What do you play now? This is where uh, you can... White clearly has a nice advantage here. He's up a piece for a couple pawns. Uh, but I don't want to let go of the initiative. I don't want to play moves that allow him to attack and me to have to defend. So what do you play here? Can you do knight g6, pawn captures g6, queen to f4? Queen to where? So knight to g6, pawn mm -hmm. takes on g6, queen yeah. to f4. Well, queen's on d1, so unfortunately you can't go to f4. Uh, Oh yeah, right. I did, uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, but that's that's the type of stuff you should be looking for. Um, so the knight is under attack. The obvious moves that come to mind are uh, things like knight g5 or knight to e5. Which do you think is better?
knight to g5 opens up a line on the king. On then the king. The black king. Then the knight to g5 check. Well, yeah, knight g5. It doesn't, I'm don't... sorry, knight to g6. Yeah, uh, but knight to g5. Then knight to g5. Yeah, so let's compare the two. After knight to g5, um, he might have knight g6 check, but I'm not, it's still not clear. Okay, he, he can't take because the queen would be, but, but after knight g5, which is a good idea, um, black has something like queen to d6, which not only gets the queen out of the forking square, but it counterattacks, it covers g6 and it counterattacks on h2, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that suddenly <laughs> back on his heels just a little bit. There's absolutely no reason if we don't have to to allow white, black any kind of counterplay. So let's compare that to knight to e5 and see which we like better. So we play knight to e5. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, it gums up the work so there's no attack in h2. You're threatening things like, uh, you know, maybe either knight to g6 check, queen g4, even under certain circumstances, knight takes c4. Um, and the only question really is, with all these threats, you know, even, you know, heck, knight c6 might be good. The only question after knight e5 is what happens on queen takes e7. The uh, queen takes, uh, that's after knight to e5, right? Exactly, exactly. Very good. Yep. Yeah, so if, you, if, he, if he takes queen to e7, then it's knight to g6 and wins the queen. Okay, it's absolutely true. It wins the queen now after f takes g6. Okay, rook takes e7 and king takes e7. What's the material count? <laughs> Who's actually ahead of material? So black actually has a bishop, rook, and two pawns for the queen, which technically is, is actually a material advantage, right? Yeah. Okay, so do we do we want to give up material? So in one way, in one way with knight g5, we still keep a promising position, but suddenly we have to defend a little bit because of queen d6, and we might give up the initiative. The other way, we play knight g5, and technically you give up material but we maintain the initiative. What do you think is the better way to go? Keep the initiative. Absolutely, bingo, 95, exclamation point. It might be even that the engine evaluates those two moves at roughly equal, but from a human perspective, keeping the initiative is absolutely the right way to go. We don't care about the material so much, because in the end, even though Black has more material, his king's out in the wide open. And actually, I noticed another little trick that meant they had to give some material back anyway. But even without that trick, White is just simply much better. He took, he takes e7, knight g6 check, takes, takes, takes. And here we've got this horrible, lonely king on the middle of the board. All I have to do is get my rook involved and the game's over. Okay, so let's make sure now, don't forget, one of my problems was I didn't have that strikeout pitch. You know, use a baseball analogy, right? Tactically, not so gifted. I can't tell you how many times I have positions like this against better players and let them off the hook. How do we finish this guy off strong? What do we play right here? Don't take your foot off the gas. Black 
Well, it's clean to E1 check. Definitely a possibility. But how does that actually help get our, our pieces coordinated and our rook and queen into the game? Uh, it doesn't, right? No, it doesn't. Exactly. But that's a, it's a good first thought. Because it's a forcing move. It's a check. Okay, the other obvious move is queen takes g4. Right. With rook e1 checked fall, right? That makes sense. <clears throat> but I noticed something better. See if you guys can find it. What's the best move? Can you force the bishop back so that you can control d5? Bingo. Nice suggestion. Who is that, by the way? Uh, Jay. Okay, nice. Nice call. Exactly. B3. B3. Yeah. If the bishop moves back, then queen takes d5 is devastating. Because now the queen's playing center field. The king is even more wide open. A rookie one check is coming, right? Yeah. So the sad truth is that black couldn't even move the bishop. He needs to cover d5. He just needs to cover d5. So he actually had no choice but to sacrifice his bishop. Okay, but still, even here, after rook fd8. Yeah, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I could screw this position up. You have to still play actively and precisely, at least reasonably precisely. So let's still finish him off. What's the next move? Queen to e3. Okay, queen e3 is not bad. King d6 covers the c5 pawn. Uh, probably a winning move. I think I, if I remember right, what I did was I decided to play with both my pieces. Rook d1. I believe, okay. Actually, I did play queen e3. Sorry, I apologize. Okay. Rook e1 is another good move. Oh, the reason I played this is I found a very specific reason for it. So it's, it's a good suggestion. And uh, after king d6 to stop him from rolling his pawns. King d6. And uh, what would be the follow-up? So who suggested queen e3? Can you find the follow-up? Uh, queen to f4. Queen to where? Sorry. F f4. Oh, f4. Check. Yes. Okay. Not bad. Not, not bad at all. Okay. So you, you absolutely are on the right track. Um, I played something slightly different. I played queen to d3 because that allowed me to get my queen in diagonally one way or the other. Oh. Um. He found nothing better than to play c4, queen here, took here. And I didn't take this pawn because I wanted another pawn. I took it to be able to get at the king in the dark squares. I want to be able to play queen e7 or c7 here. Check. And actually, he played b3, if I remember right. And now I calculated the rest of the game till mate. See if you guys can do the same. Queen c7 check. Yeah, I believe that's the best move. Yep. Okay. Good. Because if you play queen e7 check, he can last a little longer by playing rook d6. And you want to allow that. Okay, so he plays king b4. Now what? Queen e7 check. Very nice. And if he goes to a5? Queen to c5 check. King a6. Queen b5 mate. Queen b5 mate. Very good. Okay. All right. So he can't go. So queen e7 check. He can't go to, to a5. Can't go to b5. Can't go to c5. He has to go to king to c3. And what does white play then? 
So queen e7 check, king c3 forced, more or less, unless we want to give up rook. Um, queen e1. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I, I was thinking uh, queen e3. Yeah, queen e3 allows them to go back to b4, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's why the other suggestion, I believe that was Jules. Was that you, Jules? Yeah, I said queen e1. Queen e1, very good. Queen e1 checks the key move. If he goes king d4 then, then what do you do? Queen e3, mate. Exactly. So king c2 is really the only move. And then how do you finish him off? Um, is it? Oh, oh uh, rook c1. Okay, very good. King b2. Um, yeah. Queen d2. King a3. And rook a1. Bingo. Very nice. Queen e7 check. King c3. Queen e1 check. And he saw us coming. He actually resigned here. But if we continue on, we get king c2. Rook here. Here. Horst. And mate. So, <laughs> as you might imagine, that was a big win for me. Because not only did I calculate well, but I also judged the positions well and played pretty well with the initiative. Um, so I was very happy after that, and it shows that I was learning at least from my losses and my failures, <coughs> which I think is very important. So I'd like to go on now to the next example. Um, sorry. We have two more. Um, this game is actually the last tournament game I played, and then I'd like to show one more after that if people are okay with it. Um, so here is a game. It's actually against an up-and-coming kid named uh, Peter Theodore Boris. I don't know if anybody knows him. Uh, he's 2100, but he's only like 12 years old or something like that. He's climbing rapidly. And uh, another example of uh, shows a good example of how I've learned over the years to do better with the initiative. So here we go. Let me uh, see if I can first change the settings here. Whoops. Not what I intended to do. So by the way, I just want to say you guys have been fantastic so far. Thank you very much for your attention and your participation. Can't imagine a better audience. I just want to say thank you. And let's have it from here. Okay, so I played d4, and I had no idea what this kid played. The last round was delayed in this tournament until maybe 40 minutes late because uh, one game in the previous round was going on forever. It's actually on one of the top two boards where uh, this guy named uh, Jimenez uh, Corrales, uh, GM, Fidel Jimenez Corrales, uh, he managed to win a tense game against another GM, but it took forever. So I know had no clue what he played. Black. Um, but it ended up he played this semi-terrorist defense. Uh, and in the past, I've used various lines against the semi-terrorist. Um, but one thing I know is that if you play the main line, it's actually quite difficult for White to get anything. Um, so I played a, a sideline here for the first time. F C5, the normal move is knight F3. But after that, after C takes D4, black has less space, so he trades one more merit pair of minor pieces. And then he castles. And actually, believe it or not, even though white has a nice center, it turns out to be extremely hard to use it. Um, Black uh, has a simple plan of playing b6, knight b7, bishop d7, and he just dares white to do anything he wants. And actually, end games are good for black because of his two to one majority on the queen side there, in most cases. So if White doesn't actually get some kind of attack, he, he actually can drift into trouble. So what I do, and what I did in this game for the first time, was to play this uh, sideline of Rook B1. The whole point of Rook B1 is to stop the bishop before check after the exchange, and so Black can't exchange another set of minor pieces. 
Also, it does put pressure on the V7 square. A little bit like the Grunfeld main line, if anybody knows that. So bishop B7 is the most popular move. Fine. Now knight F3. Then he, <laughs> he surprised me right in the opening by playing this move knight C6. Okay. And I thought to myself, I know that's not what I'd seen in my preparation. In my preparation, by I mean, a couple months prior, I looked at this line for, I looked at a couple games by Ding Liren. And, uh, you know, I, I vaguely remember the contours of how those games went. None of them had knight c6 involved. I started realizing that after knight c6, I know this rook b1 line is not supposed to allow bishop b4 check, but now he's threatening to play cd, cd, and bishop b4 check, even in a temple loss. I'm thinking, I don't remember that ever being possible in a rook b1 line. So I started thinking there must be something wrong with this move. <clears throat> and let's see if we can figure it out. So, does anybody see any kind of moves here that can take the initiative? D5. Yeah, D5. Now, what's so special about D5? I mean, the biggest thing is that if you notice, this knight here is kind of dominated by this knight here. You can't play the knight to a nice central square like E5 or D4. Um, so it means that the knight after d5 is pushed away somewhere undesirable, right? Let's try to reason it out. So after d5, it's probably best advice to take. So e takes, e takes. And then where where should we look at first? Where should the knight go? You're talking about the white knight? No, after uh, after d5, e takes, e takes, the black knight is attacked. It really has to move. Where should it move to? E5. Yeah, e5 is the first move I looked at. Because it, at least it keeps the knight in play rather than having to retreat to b8. But those are the two possibilities, right? a5 and b8. Yeah. So after knight a5, what does white do to keep the momentum? Uh, Queen, uh, queen, go ahead. queen to a4 check. Yeah, queen a4 check is okay. Um, I was actually, I, I switched the moves a little bit in my mind. I had bishop b5 check first. So bishop b5 check, bishop to d7 is the most reasonable move, right? Right. And then what? Then your queen a4 move, right? Mm. And the threat now after queen a4 would be bishop takes d7 check, and if queen takes d7, what would happen? Anybody see the big problem? What's protecting the knight on a5 now? Yeah, it's hanging. It's hanging, right? Yep. So after queen takes, you go queen takes a5. So in reality, after d5, e takes d5, e takes d5, knight a5, bishop b5 check, bishop d7, queen a4. Black's best is just play bishop takes b5 check, queen takes b5 check, and then move the king to f8. Now, at that point, there's no more forcing moves, really. How would you evaluate the position? Would you rather be white or black? Probably white. Yeah, I mean, look at the coordination of forces, right? You're going to have a pat. You're going to have a center pass pawn. You're going to have right. your your B file is going to be open. Very good. Yes. So you force this king queens, to move so he can't castle. Yeah. You've got active pieces everywhere. You've got a pass deep on. And the big thing is he's going to have problems getting this rook into play for quite a while, right? Yep. So clearly in an open position, you really don't want your rook <coughs> to move. So we can already say that knight a5 line is discarded. Terrible. 
Okay, so after d5, e takes, e takes, he has to play knight b8. Problem. That's what we're thinking. All right, so what do you play there? Remember, we're trying to keep the initiative. Does uh, bishop f4 work um, with the idea of d6? Uh, not a bad idea. If I just castle, though. Oh, d6, uh, bishop f6, then? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not saying it's terrible, but it, I don't think you can say white's winning there. Well, let's, let's try let's... more forcing stuff. Certainly, that's certainly Bishop F4 idea is certainly a reasonable idea. Mm -hmm. try to, let's try to use more forcing lines. Um, how about uh, Bishop to B5 check? Yeah, we got to look at that. Very good suggestion. Nice. Okay, now let's at least take a look. What are Black's options? Okay. His knight's on yeah. B8, remember. He can move his king, but we already know it's just a, a victory for, for white. I mean, not a one game, but it's a big concession for black. So that means he only really can play either knight to D7 or bishop to D7, right? Right. That's a consequence of playing C5, really. has no C6. <laughs> okay, so let's take knight D7 first. Clearly, that's a suspicious move because it blocks everything. And can you see after knight to d7 what white can do? Yeah, knight to e5. Okay, not a bad idea, but there's even better. I like it. Knight e5 is a forcing move, but not as forcing as it could be. E e6. Wrong letter. I think you meant the other letter. <laughs> oh. You meant d6, right? Um, no, on D5, right? Yeah. One's on D5. Uh, am I missing something? D takes E6? No. No, we already took. So after D5, E takes D5, E takes D5. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Knight, knight B8. Yeah. And then <laughs> bishop B5 check, Knight D7, we have D6. Okay. And if uh, the bishop moves, then we have Queen E2 check, <laughs> which is devastating, right? Because white's Black's pieces are all clogged up. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So knight d7 is terrible. So d5, he takes d5, he takes d5, knight to b8, bishop to b5 check. His only resource now is bishop to d7. Okay, everybody there? So how does white continue there? D6 threatens a bishop. That is true, actually. But the problem with that is that I can actually play bishop takes B5. Uh -huh. uh, and when you take on E7, I take queen takes E7 check. And actually, oh, I have a little problem with white because I can't even block on E2. Yeah, but see, once the, bishop, the, the white bishop moves, doesn't uh, B7 drop with the rook? Well, yeah, well, let's think about this. <clears throat> Clearly, that way, white's sacrificed the pawn already. His queen's on, the queen's on e7. So that would mm -hmm. be b7 pawn, right? And then, yes. But think about, um, you're thinking about good. You're thinking about forcing options, which is very good. But we, we haven't talked about the most forcing of all options, which is what's the most forcing move in that position? Not d6. Not, um, I can't remember what other move was suggested, but. Okay, so with the bishop b5 check, bishop d7, what's the most forcing move on the board? Just take it. Rook, rook yeah, takes bishop. b7. Oh, no, yeah. no, the bishop's on b5, right? Yes, yeah. 
Bishop takes d7 check, right? It's the most forcing move on the board. Let's at least take a look at it. So black has two recapture possibility, right? You can play it takes, knight takes d7 or queen takes d7. Uh, you can see what's wrong when knight takes d7 right away, right? Mm -hmm. What What is that? It was something you just mentioned a minute ago. Rook b7. Yeah, rook takes b7. You lose a pawn, right? Very good. Yes. Okay, so now we know maybe that's not completely fatal, but it's certainly not desirable for black. So it's nice that we noticed that after bishop takes d7, he has to play queen. Queen takes d7. All right. So he's still pretty backward in development. Can you think of another aggressive move? If you want to play aggressively here, what do you play? So queen's taken on d7? That's right. So we'll go through the moves again. It's d5, e takes, e takes, knight b8, bishop b5 check, bishop b7, bishop takes d7, queen takes d7. Knight to e5? Yeah, knight e5 is begging to be played, right? Attack the queen. Yeah. If he plays a move, a normal move like queen c7, what's the follow-up? Queen to d a4? Yes, queen a4. Very nice. Nice job. Excellent. Queen a4 check. Now we've got a knight on e5 and a queen on a4. And if he doesn't want to move the king, which is ugly, and he, he blocks on d7 with the uh, knight, at the very least, we can liquidate with knight takes, queen takes, queen takes, check, king takes, and rook takes b7, check, right? Right. And a pawn, and we're kicking the king around. Does everybody see that? Yeah. So a normal move like queen c7 is just no good after knight e5. So what would black play after knight e5? Queen f5? Yeah, was that Melly? Yep. Very nice. Queen f5, okay. Queen f5, crap. Queen f5 attacks the loose knight on e5 and the loose rook on b1. So what do you do? Well, you have a check on a4 if you want, right? Yeah. To prevent yeah. him from castling. Yeah, so say he plays king f8 there. He has other options, but let's just say king f8. Two pieces hanging. Yeah, maybe that was hasty. So let's talk about this for a second because we're all trying to improve our initiatives play, right? Even though I know some of you are out there are better with it than I am for sure, but we can all we can all improve. <clears throat> so what's your gut feeling after 95 queen f5? You feel that white's overpressed his hand, that there probably has to be something there for white or something in between. We should keep him from castling. Um, you know, material is secondary for sure. Okay, so we play queen a4 check, he plays king f8. Well, we have the move queen f4, if anything. Yeah, what's the Right, Because if you take on b1, obviously, queen takes f7 is mate. 
That's right. But I, I'd rather mate you than going to an ending. Well, but maybe mate's not possible, right? <clears throat> if but, not, then I'll play queen, queen f4. Yeah, so think about it. Queen f4, if he trades queens, for instance, then you have a huge lead in development in that ending, right? More active yeah, it still looks very easier. good. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say black is dead lost, but which side would you rather be? Oh, white's doing great. White's doing great. For sure. Yeah, exactly. So that's very nice. Um, now, the thing is, what about other moves along the way? What about uh, after queen a4 check? What about king to d8? Then there's no more mate. Is the knight still on e5? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Thanks for sticking with it. I know it's uh, not so easy at nine, ten o'clock at night to <laughs> visualize. It's something. fun, though. <laughs> yeah, knight's still on e5. The king just went to d8. The queen's on a4. So you got fork there. Yeah, how? I mean, if you Rook play knight to f7. King fork on uh, f7. I mean, right, but f7. the queen... The queen's on uh, the black queen's on f5. So if you play knight takes f, oh. you just play queen takes f7. Try to follow along. The answer there is also queen f4. Okay, because the king's no better on d8 than it was on f8. <clears throat> and the thing is, if queen takes b1, then we get the fork you're talking about. And after king c7, we play knight takes h8. And there's no way to trap the knight. And uh, the key to this whole thing. It makes it all work. And it's one thing, if you want to be a, a good calculator, you have to see is that the queen on f4 actually protects the bishop on c1. Yeah, I thought the bishop was hanging for a second. There you go. That's uh, important to admit that kind of stuff if you want to improve that. So after the queen takes on b1, we have time to take the rook on h8 because the queen cannot take on c1. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. And then there's also one more move. <clears throat> after queen a4 check, there's knight c6 which uh, actually we'll get to because that was played in the game. <clears throat> so I had also seen something about that. And there's one other move too. You've got to be careful. One little trick that you miss to make a huge difference in the game. After the queen goes to f5, after queen a4 check, he could play b5. And it's possible that by wrong footing your queen, the whole, you know, you're no longer a queen f4. But the key to there to realize is that if the queen takes b5 check, the queen covers the rook on b1. So at the very least, White can save the knight, and black just dropped a pawn. So these are the kind of calculations you have to do if you want to, to master the initiative. You got to see these details, or else often you can only play by gut intuition so much, you know. So now imagine how I felt here. Um, this was this was like a breakthrough for me because so often I just had muddled thoughts and missed stuff, gave up on stuff. Honestly. You know that line where he played with d5, the knight to b8, the bishop b5 check? Bishop takes, bishop, queen takes rather, <clears throat> um, you know, bishop d7, bishop, all this stuff. And before I started my calculation training, I guarantee you there was only a 50 50 shot I'd even see queen f5. You know? And after I started my work and got a little better at calculation, I'm certain that I would have seen queen f5, saw the two pieces hanging, and said, oh man, forget it, the whole line sucks, and gotten confused. But since I did so much work on the initiative, I knew that enough red flags were up that I should keep pressing. And it only took me a total of eight minutes to calculate all of this during the game. And I saw the queen f4 idea. I said, that's good enough for me. So really proud of this. And actually the rest of the game was pretty cool too. So let's keep going. So let's talk, let's, uh, let me show you the uh, continuation. So d5, he takes, he takes. And certainly knight a5, as we talked about, just for people who uh, weren't quite sure, the knight is very vulnerable on a5 after here, this. The king has to move because otherwise the knight would be lost. So that was easy to calculate. Instead, in the game, he played knight b8, bishop here. And as we know, if he plays knight d7, we push d6, so he has to play bishop d7. Takes, takes with the, the queen is forced, otherwise we just lose a pawn on b7. <laughs> and certainly white could just castle here. But I was happy to have found all this stuff from the original position because it was a good exercise for me anyway. E95. 
queen f5, and then queen a4 check. And just to show it, probably the most resilient defense is something like king f8, but then queen f4, and we can take a look at this ending, and it's it's pretty easy to see that white's well ahead here. And if we look at the the engine, it agrees. It shows you about plus one. That's almost a pawn advantage, or about a pawn advantage, really. So it, definitely our judgment was correct. Okay. So going back in the game, he played a move that kind of surprised me because it wasn't as good. It was knight c6. It was kind of creative, but um, not good enough. So, okay, so let me ask you this. What would you play here? Oh, white is just winning after just pawn takes knight, right? Oh, pawn takes, uh, queen, queen takes queen takes e five check. Bishop e three. Queen takes c three check. King f one. Oh, actually, mm -hmm. hang on. The, maybe the maybe just king e two. King e two maybe is better. Uh, well, I was banking on c takes b seven, and that pawn should be winning. Well, there's it. Might be. Um, that looks a little bit, uh, let's say, I don't know, not so clear to me. Well, you bring your <laughs> f rook to, or h rook to c1, and uh, mm -hmm. the, and you castle artificially with, you know, king f1 eventually. Yeah, it's definitely a possibility, and I seriously considered it, but I found something I thought was much clearer. I guess knight takes c6 is easier, right? Okay, what do you play on queen takes b1? Uh, I mean, simply knight e5 check, but there's b5, I guess, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. That's a good thing to notice. Very nice. Yeah. But then uh, even there, queen f4, but he castles. Yeah, that's that sucks. Yeah, it's annoying, isn't it? Yep. Think think about the initiative. Forget about. Uh... I mean, okay. In that case, just I mean, I'm sure there's a win. So knight takes e seven check, uh, king e seven castles should also win. Right. Although he might get a chance to tuck his king away. Uh, I mean, I'm threatening bishop g five, check. So I, really, can he do that? Um. Well, for instance, I mean, maybe he can play just king f8 right away or something. And granted, he's not in great shape, but think about it from more of a getting all my pieces in play quickly type of idea. And don't forget the knight on c6, he can't take the knight, right? Because you take queen takes c6 in his check and you win the rook in a8. But after knight takes c6, queen takes b1, what's the most natural move? Castling is also possible. Exactly. Castling. Now, not only are we threatening discoveries with a knight, but we're threatening things like rook e1, right, which would win the bishop on e7. And all kinds of nasty stuff with a bishop move <laughs> on c1. Yep. So yeah, it's that's true. like a much clearer win than allowing, you know, my king bouncing around the center a little bit. It might be true that both win, but... I like keeping the initiative and having my king safe where his isn't. So, in fact, it has forced him. He played the right continuation after knight c6. Queen takes b1 on the castle. This move took me about three seconds. And then uh, we're a th big threat of rookie one. And he realized the best thing he could do is just give up the material and he castle. Well, at first he played b5, actually. Sorry. Uh, I also noticed that on f6 he lost. Um, 
the idea behind f6 was some, it was something I calculated on rook e1. He can take the knight because the king can tuck on f7 and his rook on a is defended, right? So what do you play here? Uh, how about d6? Um, d6 right here? Let's see. Probably not bad. How about rook e1? Yeah, rook e1. Knight takes e7 is easy, right? Yeah, rook e1 might not be bad either. Um, the problem with rook e1 is simply that he it, it, it might, it might still be fine. He goes here and his rook is protected. Now you can go here. So it gets a little bit more messy, rather. You know, it's a king over here. There's no good discovery of the bishop. You can take the bishop, but it's not as obvious to me that that's winning. But in the interest of the initiative, all you have to do here is take knight takes e7. And when king takes, now d6 check, and you're just making it so the king is completely wide open, right? Uh, he can't take the pawn because of bishop f4 check. <laughs> So he has to go, say, king d8. And then his king is just is completely caught in the crosshairs. He will not survive. So this, to me, is uh, the cleanest win you can get after f6. And for instance, actually, after king d8, looking at it now, um, let's see. What would be the easiest way from here? Anyway, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but this is this is just awful for black. So O oh, O. Oh. He played E5. Now I had a really pleasant choice. It turns out the two candidate moves I had here were Queen A6. Okay, because you're threatening Queen B7 then, which would attack the rook and the bishop. Or Queen G4. And honestly, the only reason I didn't play Queen G4 is because of this continuation. Queen G6 and giving up uh Two pieces for the rook, but getting to an end game, where I thought he might have a little bit of annoying chances to hold, uh, just because his king is actually quite active. So I chose queen a6. It turns out that there was another move that I noticed that a friend of mine saw. Uh, queen f4 actually is the best, but queen a6 is perfectly good enough. And because of the threat of queen to b7, he really doesn't have anything better but to just give up the material. So he casts him. If he tries to play bishop f6, for instance, then he just gets slaughtered of the rook e1 king here and queen here, and it's just over. He gets mated. Checkmate. So he did the right thing in castled, and I took here. Check. It's always nice to take a piece of check. All right. So here's the next problem, okay? You want to keep going without giving up any initiative. I've got two pieces for a rook. I think two pieces, one, two, three, four. Yeah, two pieces for a rook and a strong pass d-pawn. So this guy is obviously the thing that's going to win me the game. But the one thing white doesn't have is any anchor points for minor pieces. Let me ask you this. Critical question. Once you get this nice advantage here, how do you continue without letting it slip? I guess trade down where you can. That's not too bad an idea. Um, the, the thing that you want to do is coordinate your pieces and um, <clears throat> try to find an arrangement where they're all safe and working together. 
And they also so, hopefully help advance the deep on. Amazingly, there's no great discoveries. I spent some time looking at Bishop H6 and it just doesn't do anything. <laughs> Bishop F4. Okay, Bishop F4, say he goes queen to D3. And there, probably d6 isn't bad at all, huh? But, um, Bishop e5? Bishop e5, he might have f6. Bishop e3. Yeah, Bishop b 3 is what I chose in the game. Now, why do you say Bishop b 3 Can take the c5 pawn also protect the knight. That's right. Actually, that's good. And um, <clears throat> the other thing, too, is uh, you know that the queen, the black queen is going to go to d3 and then take on c3. The bishop is going to be loose on c5. So how do you arrange your pieces such that the bishop is safe, everything's safe? How do you do it? Uh, eventually, bishop can retreat to b4 well if the queen is taking the c3 pawn and it has no anchor on b4 yeah the key to me was when i found that you know, this arrangement where you have the bishop on c5 protecting the knight and helping to advance the pawn and the queen on c6 pretending protecting the bishop and the knight covers the c8 square so the queen cannot be harassed by any rook c8 mm -hmm. So before oh. we move on, I have a question. Sorry to yeah, yeah, go ahead. cut you off, Jeff, but no. did you look at the variation bishop g5, queen d3, queen f6? So you can't take because it's mate, right? Yeah, that's so a queen good So queen takes uh, d5, also not possible because knight that's covers true. it. Mm -hmm. And I want to play knight f5 next. You still can't take because uh, g takes f6, bishop takes f6, king g8, knight h6 would be made. Yeah, that's a very nice idea. Let's see if we can refute it. I didn't really look at it because I didn't see the queen f6 idea. So bishop g5, queen d3 looks best. Queen f6, interesting idea for sure. Or queen e4, I'm not sure which one's better. Yeah, maybe since I'm not attacking c5 with the bishop, I might as well play queen e4. Um, but the question is from either place, how can you actually stop this stuff? Yeah, knight f5 is definitely a threat. Uh, h6 Three. might hold, actually. Let's see. So bishop takes h6. But then you take the queen. And they take the queen, yeah. Exactly. Ah, shame. That might be the Good only try. way to defend. Let's find out. There's nothing else. There's no problem with finding out, right? Uh, let's just put it on E4. Yeah, these kind of passive sacrifices are really difficult because Black has so many apparent options right now. Um, let's see if there's anything up there in H6. Black has only one move, like a window of one move to defend. Otherwise, knight f5 will decide the game. Yeah, probably. And, and he has h6, so that, that is... That well, I mean, is if he, for instance, if he just moves the uh, f8 rook, and he plays knight f5, he's got g takes f6, bishop takes king g8, and then the king has the f8 square, right? So something like this. Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, but d6, yeah? Right, but now there's no more mate, right? So it's 
I mean, the H6 might be good, but I mean, I, I think there's more than one defense, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, well, you still can't take my queen, and I moved my... No, I still can't take your queen. You know, I can play d7 sometimes. I mean, I'm thinking, what if you just play something stupid like this? I don't know. It's not exactly clear what white's next move is. But I think your original idea was even better. I think h6 probably is the best. Yeah, I think that's when you stop looking at it with white, when you see h6. Let's check it out with the engine, see if the engine shows us whether we're right or wrong. Because honestly, I didn't look too much with this as with an engine. So bishop b3 is the best, but let's see what it says about bishop g5. Oh, it does win. It does win, yeah. Queen h6 so queen f4 ah uh, that's clever yeah of course queen f4 yeah. yeah of course queen f4 because if you play d6 you just win the game that, you know that's that's the yeah so idea. queen f4 and then you take it he takes back and you're just going to win with your extra material okay. um yeah but black could have played queen d3 instead anyway i don't want to derail you too much no, no, from that's the okay. this is fine thing, this, is, this is important stuff we see ideas ideas are great but queen d3, then the queen Okay, has... then you cannot play queen f6, yeah? Because, yeah, because of, it. yeah, H6. very good, very good. And now there's no more queen f4. Interesting. That's pretty subtle. I mean, there's queen f4, but it's not as good. But you're still better at, even after, even even when you drop a piece, it's, it's your position is not good. I know, isn't it amazing? Yeah. That's very creative, Melly. That's exactly what you should be looking for. I uh, have to admit, it was tough for me to look Thanks. at stuff like that after getting a material winning advantage that's a psychological issue for sure but i found what i thought was a pretty safe way to arrange my pieces that one so i didn't look any further <clears throat> um, so i played bishop b3 you play queen d3 Bishop takes queen takes and i figured even though it opened up the file for the rook which looks ridiculous <clears throat> i thought he actually had more counterplay with a b, b pawn so i took the pawn finally probably one of the toughest decisions of the game he played Rook to eight, and I play queen c6. Now my constellation is complete. <clears throat> okay. Um, he really can't assail this formation here in any which way. Everything's protected. All right. So he plays queen to d3. All right. Now what does white play here? Anybody? So what candidate moves are you guys looking at? So I was looking at d6, but rook b1 is probably winning for, but for the wrong side. <laughs> very good. Very good. It's, it's very easy when you're sort of uh, got a plan of attack, an advantage with the initiative to forget about your opponent. You know, your opponent actually has a huge threat here, rook b1. But you're right. If I play d6, rook b1 wins the game for black. Um, okay, so good. So noticing these threats is very important. to throw away an entire game. But what do you play? h3 with a sly smile. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. Why, why is that better in g3? <laughs> uh, it's just, uh, I mean, it's less weakening, and I have a dark squared bishop. It's just... I don't know. It's just common and specifically, sense. Specifically, do you see that rook b1, rook takes, queen takes, king g2, queen e4 check, and suddenly you start getting bounced around the light squares, right? True. Uh, he doesn't have any checks after h3 instead. 
Yeah, exactly. So H3 is clearly the better move. In fact, G3 you might throw away the win as well. Okay, good. So now rook, rook B1 is no big deal. So he played rook D8. Okay, and uh, now I basically calculated pretty much in the end of the game. Um, what, what do you think the right moves here for white? There's probably a bunch of good moves, but what do you think really hits the nail on the head? Our goal is to shepherd the deep on down, right? <clears throat> yeah, so D6 or Queen C7, not sure which one's better. Yeah, they're not bad, but still you have to break through that back rank, right? So what's uh, the biggest problem for white is breaking through which square? D7. D7 or even D8, right? <clears throat> I mean, the problem is that, you know, it's, I guess you get a knight on C6, no problem. But the way I was thinking is that I'd love to get my bishop where? Where would you love this bishop to be? On C7? Yeah, C7 is a good move. Yeah, C7 is a good square. Yeah, and this diagonal, right? You like it to control D8, exactly, because that would break the blockade. If he can drive the rook away from the D file, then the pawn has pretty much an easy path, right? So the simplest move is simply bishop takes A7, because now you get the B6 square, right? And in fact, I calculated a nice little trick here that I wish he had fallen into because it would have been a better ending. Um, played rook a8, which makes sense. I played bishop b6. <clears throat> and now, unfortunately, he played a poor move. I mean, maybe uh, it's not as, there's nothing any better, but I was really kind of hoping he'd play rook a6 here. And did you see what I was going to play then? You can probably just take the rook, yeah? Okay. Let's calculate it out. Bishop takes d8. What happens then? So rook takes queen. Um, d takes rook on c6. Queen takes d8. That's right. And let's see what we can do. What's the easiest win? Um, rook B1, maybe? Yeah, rook B1 is a very good move, but I like rook C1 better. So now you're threatening okay. C7, right? Yep. Okay, so his only try is queen to D2. And then, what do you play? Then rook B1. That's right. And now if queen to d6, trying to stop both rook b8 check, mate, and c7. Knight d5. Bingo. Very nice. Let's take a look at that. So nice calculation, Millie. Thanks. So bishop takes d8. That's my plan. Takes, takes, takes. Now rook c1. I mean, I think rook c1 is the most precise, although I think rook b1 also wins. Um, but you're forcing him to play queen d2 here because c7 is just a terrible thing. Uh, if he obviously plays queen c7, he got knight d5. So queen c7, now rook b1, which is a move I struggled at. I didn't quite see it during the game. I saw it afterwards. Rook b1. Um, then um, he has no choice but to play queen d6 here to stop mate and c7 push. And now knight d5. 
and you're going to force through the C7 push. It takes the night, you just stay here. And, well, actually, it takes the night, you get meeting, meeting two. Sorry. Other background. Pretty nice, huh? That would have been cool, cool stuff. But he played Rook on you know, B8, unfortunately. <laughs> and maybe win much more prosaically. So now, whoever said get the bishop to C7 was right. Play the bishop to C7. Um, he played rook e8. Oh, the thing is, after playing bishop c7, I want to caution you guys. It seems like an innocuous move, but I had to calculate something first. If I play bishop c7, I had to calculate that um, queen takes f1 was not winning for black. After king takes... You can see that eventually the king can hide. Uh, but still, it's important to look at this stuff because you might easily miss a counterattack uh, thinking only about your own plans, right? So he played rook e8. And now came the time for d6. Clearly, I'm threatening d7, but he wanted to make it so... Uh, I mean, first I want to probably move the knight, but he wanted to make it so he can at least take the knight. I played d7, so he played queen a3. Um, and now there was no reason to hurry now because honestly, he really has no threats whatsoever. I played rook to d1. In fact, the funny thing is, at first I was thinking maybe the easiest one was queen f3. But can anybody see the problem with that? I'm um, forcing a queen trade, which would be ideal for me. Yeah. But simply after queen takes a2, it's not as easy as it should be. <laughs> Covers f7. You can play d7, but then rook takes here. And if you go d8 equals queen, I realize I'm a piece up, but there was actually something even worse that bothered me about queen f3. I can't remember exactly what it is, but uh, even this is a little tougher to win than it should, it should have to be. So instead of allowing any kind of counterplay whatsoever, after queen a3, rook d1 just consolidated everything. Uh, and if he plays rook takes e7, just take back, and he loses the rook. That's the problem with being having these back rank issues. They played uh, rook f8. And now I figured the easiest way to win was to uh, get the knight to c6, so it helped push through uh, the d-pawn. I played queen d5. Keeps an attack on the a8 rook. Queen c3. I can't remember the point of that move. Knight c6. And uh, yeah, queen f6 and d7. And he realized he was dead. He started to play rook it takes a2 and then realized that hung the rook, so he resigned. That was the end of the game. Okay, so what nice was... Game. Thank you very much. The, uh, the thing we learned from this game is that, well, um, when you feel you have an initiative, obviously, you want to calculate the forcing moves, try to keep the tempo, try to keep, yeah, try to keep the other guy on the run. But also, just because it looks like he has a counterattack like he did with that queen f5 move where he attacked the two pieces and knight on e5 and the rook on b1. You know, if your intuition is telling you that he shouldn't be able to get away with that, just keep looking for ideas. And then suddenly you find that queen a4 check, queen f4 idea, and that's good enough to, to continue on. And then once you get the initiative and, and a material advantage, don't let up. I realized I didn't see that queen f6 neat idea, but the idea still is to keep making threats uh, and not let Black, if you notice, Black never got his rooks into play, right? They always are stuck on the squares on the back rank. That's because White kept playing with forcing moves. So that's it. I have other examples, but it's way too late. I uh, want to wrap it up by uh, asking if you guys have any questions first.
Yeah, we've gone over a lot of stuff. Yeah. Well, anyway, if there's no questions, I just want to say thank you very much. It's very nice of you guys to listen to me. I hope you learned something. And I hope uh, at least it was a little bit entertaining. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank thank you. you. Thanks, Jeff. That was awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it, guys.